Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about the center of our own galaxy once again, and potentially a very intriguing and somewhat anomalous discovery from one of the recent studies. But without giving you too many spoilers right away, the assumption here is that what if it's not actually a black hole in the middle? What if it's something entirely different? And the paper itself is very intriguing in that it presents a really strong argument. But anyway, let's take baby steps. First of all, I wanted to start with this iconic video right here. This right here is the result of years and years of work that then culminated in the incredible award in physics, the Nobel Prize in Physics, in 2020. This was the confirmation that there was a really massive black hole in the center of our own galaxy. And this short video shows you approximately 20 years of orbits of various stars in the vicinity. Now the most famous of these stars, and the one that's been studied the most, is the star known as S2. There are actually quite a lot of these so-called S stars in the orbit of the um, central black hole, which in case you didn't know is known as Sagittarius A star and it's visible right there in the center. But S2 is particularly important because a few years ago, just like approximately 100 years ago, it allowed the scientists to prove something really important. It allowed the scientists to finally confirm a lot of Einstein's ideas and a lot of Einstein's theories. And ironically, just like when Einstein proved his theory of relativity by using the precession of the orbit of Mercury just over a hundred years ago, by observing the orbit of the S2 stars at the closest point to the black hole, the scientists were able to confirm various effects that are expected from such a massive object, such as for example the redshifting effect of the light itself. Which of course once again confirmed that there is a really massive black hole in the center of the galaxy. But then something else was discovered in this region, something that still doesn't really have a very good explanation. The objects that are currently referred to as the G objects, the objects that might look something like this. Although this is just the artist's impression right now, and even today it's still not entirely clear what exactly these objects are. In a nutshell though, these also seem to be stars, but stars that approach the black hole close enough for them to start to kind of fall apart and to get disrupted quite a lot, just to then rebuild themselves as they move away from the black hole. So they're sort of like stars, but not really, they're more like gas clouds. And although the original discovery itself already created quite a lot of mysteries about these objects, with potentially a completely new class of objects nobody's ever seen before, what became even more interesting is observing their orbits. And specifically about a year ago, this particular paper right here argued that something else could potentially explain what we're observing with the orbits of these objects. It was actually almost as if these objects were experiencing a bit of a drag from the vicinity of the black hole. Now one potential explanation I've discussed in one of the previous videos was that, well maybe it's that the region around the black hole, actually a very large region around the black hole, contains almost like an exosphere, or a somewhat thin atmosphere, and maybe this is what's creating this unusual drag and is forcing these objects to behave in strange ways. But this wasn't a very widely accepted explanation and more importantly it didn't explain everything, a lot of things still didn't make sense. This unusual drag force that was detected from the orbit of the G2 object was still very mysterious and very very difficult to understand. But that's at least until now. Now there's this new paper and the explanation here is very very intriguing. The explanation here replaces a very compact and really massive black hole with a somewhat less compact but also really massive some kind of a dark matter core halo or essentially a really really large chunk of dark matter all in the same spot. And though it might sound really strange, this particular idea has actually been sort of proposed before to explain how some supermassive black hole can essentially form so massive so quick. By having a really large chunk of dark matter present there in the beginning, a lot of matter can accumulate around it and then form a black hole of some sorts. But in this particular case, the scientists are really arguing that if we were to completely replace the compact black hole in the center with a much more widespread and much less compact uh, dark matter core-like formation that's made out of these hypothetical particles they refer to as darkinos, suddenly all of the observations of orbital parameters make a lot more sense. It obviously explains the orbits of S stars, but it also explains the orbits of G stars and the unusual observations of this drag that we see as well. Now, just like with a lot of other unusual propositions, this is just an idea for now, it's just a hypothesis. 
it still requires a lot of proof and chances are it might be actually proven incorrect at some point. But at the moment this is a really intriguing proposition because, well first of all, it sort of solves the problem of not being able to detect dark matter. Especially because in this paper the scientists even propose a very specific particle that could explain what we're seeing. At the same time, it sort of solves the problem with the unusual orbital observations of G objects, something that is still not really well explained. And in this case it's essentially stars just moving through a kind of a halo of dark matter and being disrupted by these particles as it passes through the dark matter. And in this case, because there is such a high concentration of it in this region, this is why the stars sort of fall apart, but then they don't really get destroyed, they kind of rebuild themselves once they move far enough away. And lastly, all of these observations still kind of make sense. If it's just a chunk of dark matter as opposed to, well I guess, a black hole, we would not really observe anything differently. While at the same time it might also explain why our black hole is not particularly active. However, it would be a lot more difficult to explain why we're seeing certain flares from this region and why we're still seeing a lot of X-ray radiation and a lot of other radiation. So obviously there are still going to be a lot of mysteries. But this is a really big assumption right now and naturally nobody really knows exactly what's happening there, especially because our telescopes are just not good enough to observe this region. So for example the Event Horizon Telescope that took the beautiful image of M87 black hole has not really been that successful with our own black hole. Things just happen so much more quickly there that it's very difficult to capture a very good image. But assuming that these scientists are correct, so what exactly is happening with the object itself, in the one in the middle? So it's not really a black hole yet, but it might turn into one, specifically a supermassive black hole, if approximately 100 times more mass is sort of introduced into it. So in other words, if the object in the middle of the galaxy becomes roughly around 15 million masses of the sun of this Darkino material, it might turn into an actual legit black hole, with the object itself in the center maybe resembling some sort of a halo-like formation like you see right here, although possibly not in this color or possibly even completely invisible. But it would definitely form some sort of a dense object in the middle, with a slightly more diffuse area around it which forms the drag that was observed in the G2 object. Which theoretically at least could then also expand to the outer reaches of the galaxy forming even larger halo-like formations around most galaxies. And when they applied their calculations to 17 known objects with 17 known orbital parameters, mathematically at least their explanation made a lot of sense. The orbit of every one of these objects, these S stars in this region, could be perfectly explained using this particular idea. And although this idea might sound a little bit strange, it also provides quite a lot of different answers to many mysteries. The mysteries of very massive black holes in the early universe, obviously the mystery of various dark matter observations around the universe, but also more importantly explains how certain black holes can grow so massive so quick. By having these seeds of dark matter that accumulates really quickly, it would be much easier for a typical black hole to form around it. So obviously it doesn't change the fact that black holes are out there and that they exist, it just changes the fact about what's in the middle of our own galaxy. But I guess for now at least, it's just an interesting hypothesis. It does not have a lot of observational proof just yet, obviously nobody has ever seen these Darkinos and they've never been detected anywhere, and even though the scientists propose a specific mass for them, we still need to actually find them. If one day this particle is discovered somewhere on Earth by one of the dark matter experiments, then this changes everything. But for now, the only thing that this paper does really well is explain the unusual parameters of G objects. But the thing is, they've only been discovered a few years ago and they're still new and not very well understood. There could be a lot of other explanations to what we're observing and some of the future explanations might not necessarily change the central black hole into a completely new object. So at least in my opinion, this is maybe not the best explanation just yet. A lot of follow-ups are needed before anything can be said with certainty. Nevertheless, it's still an intriguing proposition and a somewhat intriguing paper. It still doesn't change the fact that there is something massive in the center of our galaxy, it just changes the fact of what we think it is. I mean, maybe the scientists in this paper are right. Maybe it's not actually a black hole, but instead is a chunk of this unusual mysterious dark matter. At least one type of dark matter that's believed to exist in the universe. But it will probably be a few more studies before we can really say anything with certainty. At the moment I'm actually more curious 
to see more studies about these objects, what exactly is happening to them when they approach this object in the middle, and more importantly it'd be interesting to see what they really look like, at least by using some sort of a supercomputer simulation. But for now that's pretty much it. Intriguing paper, very interesting proposition, but no conclusive results just yet. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about a pretty exciting discovery of the closest black hole to planet Earth, a black hole that was only theoretical and most scientists didn't actually think would exist. But at least one scientist, whose paper you can find in the description below, truly believed they must be out there, and it looks like they finally found it after all. And so let's discuss this discovery of the black hole the scientists currently refer to as the unicorn, mostly because it's rare and also because it's located in the constellation of Unicorn. And also let's find out what makes this particular Unicorn black hole so special. But first of all, generally we usually detect black holes by their emissions. Even though they are called black holes, they do produce a lot of different emissions through the interaction of matter nearby. So for example, supermassive black holes obviously are also the brightest objects in the universe. They often produce these very very powerful astrophysical jets visible from literally the end of the visible universe. Then there are some other systems like this one right here known as Cygnus X1, where the black hole that you see on the left is emitting a lot of x-rays, mostly because it's absorbing a lot of the matter from its very large partner. This is usually referred to as the high mass x-ray binary. And generally that's how a lot of these smaller black holes were discovered as well. So basically when they emit a lot of x-rays, usually that's because they're consuming a lot of matter from their partner. But a couple of years ago, scientists proposed another theoretical concept for the black holes that are not as easily visible, but should still be detectable, simply through the various tidal interactions and various tidal effects that they exert on their partner star. And so in other words, the black hole itself would probably be more or less quiet, maybe even not producing any x-rays, but the star that the black hole orbits would have very certain, very specific effects observable with modern telescopes. Now, tidal effects in this case, I think are easier to understand by using Earth and the Moon. So as you probably know, the moon produces lunar tides, and at the same time the sun also produces solar tides, and once in a while they align and create megatides. But in this case, in this somewhat exaggerated simulation, you can kind of see the tidal bulge produced by the moon, which sort of causes the oceans and the level of the water in the oceans to sort of follow the moon as it orbits around the earth. But naturally, any massive object orbiting another object is going to produce these effects. And so, for example, one of the reasons why Io, the moon of Jupiter, has so many volcanoes is because of the extreme interactions, tidal interactions, with both Jupiter and the nearby moons that essentially cause it to kind of expand and contract from a lot of different angles, causing the moon to have a lot of energy on the inside, which then sort of creates volcanoes. But if nearby moons can create volcanoes on this moon, imagine what a black hole could do to a star. And so essentially, the scientists from the Ohio State University propose that these black holes do exist and very likely cause the star itself to sort of change shape completely, turning into some sort of an ellipsoid, something that should be visible by using modern telescopes. And if we detect a star that does have an ellipsoid formation that seems to repeat periodically and also changes its shape once in a while, sort of similar to what you see in this simulation right here, it really suggests only one thing something really massive and something really compact is most likely causing the star to change shape. And the data for this particular star that they investigated has been available for a very very long time. Several telescopes have already investigated it many times, but it's never really been analyzed in this particular way. With the star itself being about 1.7 masses of the sun, but it's already in its red giant stage. So basically it expanded to the point where it's much brighter and also much larger than a typical star. Because of this, it's also naturally much easier for any massive object to distort the shape of the star simply because it doesn't actually hold on to the material as strongly anymore and it's a lot easier to change the shape of this object. And so when analyzing the star known as V723 Monoceros, the scientists visualized this and saw something like this. The star was changing its ellipsoidal shape and all of this was happening quite frequently and also with predictable variability. As if something massive and compact was orbiting around this object roughly every 60 days, and surprisingly in a somewhat circular orbit. And so to the scientists this was clearly an indication 
that it was very likely some sort of a black hole at a distance of about 1500 light years away from us. Which by the way would make this the closest black hole to the solar system. But there's also something else they found that they really didn't expect. It turns out the mass of this black hole falls into what's known as a mass gap. It also seems to be the least massive black hole ever found. Or at least in like top 3 the least massive black holes. The total mass of this black hole is about 3.3 masses of the sun. And the total size of this black hole currently stands at around 20 kilometers in diameter. Actually a little bit less than that. So this will be a pretty small object in terms of the actual size. Even though technically size doesn't really matter much for black holes because here we're just talking about the size of the black hole shadow. But the mass in this case does matter and mostly because this is essentially where we are not sure if this is a mass of a typical very large very massive neutron star or if it's a mass of a very very small black hole. But based on the observations of various emissions it does seem to suggest that this is a black hole and not a neutron star. And so if this is indeed a black hole located around 1500 light years away from us at 3.3 masses of the sun, this is probably going to be one of the more interesting black holes discovered in the last few years. Now with these types of studies though we do have to be careful, mostly because of the calculations of distances to these stars. It actually happened in the past where the scientists miscalculated the total distance. And so for example if in reality this star is much farther away then this would automatically suggest that the black hole is also more massive and thus is not actually in this mass gap as it's known but more likely to be a typical uh, stellar sized black hole. So recalculating the distance to this star is going to be probably the next priority for some of the follow up studies. At the same time confirming various emissions coming from here and of course recalculating the observations using other telescopes will help the scientists confirm if maybe this is actually some sort of a ultra massive neutron star instead. Something that might actually produce even more mystery. Or for all we know this is some other exotic very compact object that other theoretical physicists have predicted exist as well. So in that sense either way it's actually a really exciting discovery, something that a lot of follow up studies will try to resolve. And since this particular system does seem to emit certain x-rays as well, it should be quite possible for the scientists to narrow down exactly what it is and exactly what we're looking at here. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be discussing something else that was recently discovered about black holes. And more specifically about what happens extremely close to black holes and how they reflect the entire universe creating an extremely interesting feature known as the photon ring. The feature that was actually originally proposed back in 1979. It was in this paper by the famous Jean-Pierre Luminet who is also famous for creating the first ever simulation of an actual black hole, the one that you see right here. He's actually also a prolific blogger so check out his blog if you'd like to learn a little bit more about all of his studies and of course a little bit more about black holes as well. As always the link for this is in the description below. But more specifically we're going to be discussing this theoretical paper you see right here that actually goes into a little bit more mathematics and finally identifies the exact mathematics we need to predict and finally finds a way to analyze and to calculate the various distances and various differences in regards to photon rings produced by different black holes. But to try to understand all of this let's begin with the idea of the black hole structure. And so here if we were to pick a random black hole that doesn't spin too much we would actually find several particular features. We would obviously find what's known as the black hole shadow, that's where no light can escape anymore. Somewhere inside of this is the event horizon. We also have the beautiful accretion disk right here. And because of the light bending effects from the black hole, the disk is bent in such a way that you can actually see the far side on top and the underside of the disk on the bottom. Here's a somewhat simplified version of all of this and what it might kind of resemble. But then right here you can also see this ring known as the photon ring. And this is a really interesting and extremely tiny region around the black hole that technically reflects the entire universe back to us. And the closer toward the black hole you look, the more reflections of distant objects you're going to be able to see. And hypothetically if you were to actually reach the event horizon and to somehow stand on the surface here, you would most likely see the entire universe repeating infinitely near the edges of the black hole itself. And because it's kind of hard to imagine this, this is maybe what it might look like. This is just a simulation using space engine. And so this region known as the photon ring is the region that we're actually discussing today. It's formed in the way that, well it's actually described in this video. 
that was created by the Center for Astrophysics by Harvard and Smithsonian Museum. So here, when the light just kind of gets deflected, we get to see this. This is more or less how the image of the M87 black hole was created as well. But some light particles will actually sort of orbit around the black hole at least once, producing a slightly thinner ring. The ring that you see right here. And some of them might even have at least two orbits or even more, which will produce even a thinner ring with a lot more detail. And because of this, various types of rings are always produced by the black hole and by the photon ring, which technically may allow us to see the entire universe depending on the location we're looking at all of this from. And in theory, there are infinite numbers of these thin rings with various subrings, including various photons from different parts of the universe that have been collected by the photon shell itself. And each of these subrings, in some sense, represent the entire universe. This is basically an image of the universe reflected by the black hole, with each individual ring also representing a different time frame when the photons were captured. So in some sense, if we were to look at this as a kind of a movie of the universe, each ring is a single frame. But at the same time, this also produces various reflections of the same object. You can actually see the same object several times. Here's sort of the image explaining how all of this works as well, with the example in this case being some sort of a random galaxy. And the light from this distant galaxy is going to be hitting the black hole at different angles. Some light will get only bent a little bit, some light will do one orbit, where some light will actually have two different orbits. And all of this will produce reflections of the same object that hypothetically could be visible if you were in the right spot. All of this might also sort of look like this. But the question is, well, where do you have to be to see the second and third reflection, for example? You don't really get to see it from the same spot. You do have to be either closer or farther away. And interestingly enough, ever since the original publication by Lumine, it's been known that the reflections do repeat depending on the distance to the black hole. And so how much closer do you have to be to see the second reflection? Well, it's been known to be this number right here, e to the power of 2 pi, or approximately 535 times closer. But after four decades, this is actually the first time that the exact mathematical explanation has been provided for why this is so. Now, if you're a math buff, this paper is free to read, so you can check it out in the description below. But to be honest, it is relatively challenging and somewhat difficult to understand, which is actually why it took so long to prove all of this and to find a solution, mathematical solution, for why the photon rings seem to follow this pattern of e to the power of 2 pi. And this of course means that there is definitely a mathematical way to try to discover more of these reflections of the same object by following a very specific path and finding the exact location. Well, at the same time, the math provided in this paper allows us to study the gravitational effects around black holes and helps us understand what exactly happens around these regions that we don't really understand mathematically, regions such as inside the event horizon or regions right around the black hole as well. And so that hypothetical mirror image of a distant galaxy can also hypothetically help us understand black holes and help us understand gravity by studying and also analyzing the effects located in these photon rings. At the same time, the scientists behind this paper also calculated that, well, if the black hole is spinning, the distance suddenly decreases quite dramatically. If it was 535 times for a non-spinning black hole, considering all black holes are spinning, this will dramatically decrease depending on how much they warp the spacetime around them. With a fast spinning black hole, you can actually technically see the reflections a lot more quicker. Each image could be now anywhere from 50 to maybe 5 to maybe even 2 times closer to the black hole as opposed to the original number 535. But this is of course in theory. In practice though, it's still extremely difficult. Now going back to that image of M87, even here, even despite many years, the scientists still have not been able to detect exactly where the photon ring is. Now the ring itself should be somewhere in this region and could maybe even be detected if more telescopes are added to the Event Horizon Telescope, but at the moment it's still invisible. It's still extremely hard to detect simply because, well, it's just too thin and because the black hole that we're studying is extremely far away as well. But if one day we somehow are able to see one of these photon rings even from that M87 black hole, it might be even possible to use some of the photons from that ring to reconstruct certain distant objects somewhere in the universe. 
at least hypothetically speaking. And by looking at several versions of the same reflection, in this case that hypothetical galaxy, we're also technically seeing different frames of the same movie. And so in theory at least, a reflection that was created by the photon ring of a distant galaxy, where we're able to capture several versions of the same reflection, might help us create some kind of a miniature movie of a certain distant galaxy, showing us how the galaxy changed over time. Or actually, a more likely scenario is that we might be able to see the light from a distant supernova, and if we're able to detect different reflections of it, we might also be able to recreate how it changed over time. Although at least for now, all of this is just theory. There's really no practical way of doing any of this just yet. And even despite all of the work from the Event Horizon Telescope, we still have so many years to go before we can actually even see a single ring somewhere out there. For now, it's a very theoretical concept, but something that the scientists are really desperately trying to find a way to look at and to study in detail. So basically, the photon ring right here is the next holy grail of the scientific discovery. Because not only does it show us the universe, the entire universe, from a different perspective and a different frame of reference, but it also provides a lot of information about the black hole and the gravity around the black hole. All of this is of course extremely important for us in order to learn more about the universe itself. Long, long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, well, actually about 53 million light years away from us, and I guess in this sense 53 million years ago, the light left this really, really massive black hole, and we were able to capture it a few years ago. Hello, wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about some major updates from the M87 galaxy that a few years ago allowed us to create this absolutely mind-blowing image of a massive black hole in the middle of the galaxy, the iconic image you see right here. And although the image itself is probably one of the most famous pictures of 2019, in the last two years a lot of scientists have been desperately trying to learn as much as they could, both about the galaxy known as Messier 87 and of course about the black hole in the middle. Now Messier, as you probably know, was a French astronomer who loved comets. He loved them so much as a matter of fact that he made sure to catalog everything that wasn't a comet and everything that would prevent you from seeing comets in order to find more of them. And he was obsessed with this hobby to the point where he created what's known today as a Messier catalog. In that catalog, the object number 87, or as Messier would refer to it, the not comet number 87, was an object that sort of looks like this from a relatively powerful telescope. This is essentially the most massive nearby galaxy within a distance of about 100 million light years away from us. This is an extremely massive galaxy known as Messier 87. And like a lot of other massive galaxies, it also has an ultra-massive black hole in the middle, and you can kind of see the effects this black hole is producing. It's producing this relatively large astrophysical jet that you can kind of see in blue, which is roughly around 5,000 light years in length, and is surprisingly pointing slightly toward us. Now, about a decade ago, actually a little bit longer than that, back in 2006, scientists from the Event Horizon Telescope had this absolutely mind-blowing idea. Something that I guess back then nobody thought would be possible. They realized they could hypothetically create an Earth-sized telescope by combining data from various radio telescopes across the planet, including one right here in a remote location in Antarctica, and then by using relatively complex algorithm, they would be able to recreate what they're looking at and thus produce a relatively accurate image of something really, really massive, really, really far away. And they figured, well, why don't we take a picture of a black hole? Now, naturally, the first candidate everyone thought of would be Sagittarius A star, the supermassive black hole in the middle of our own galaxy. But this apparently is a lot more problematic than it seems. First of all, in terms of the size comparison, if you were to look at Sagittarius A star and if you were to look at M87, surprisingly, in the night skies, this one is slightly larger in size. And that's because of its total mass. And, well, allow me to demonstrate. So, this is M87 a black hole that's about 6.5 billion masses of the sun. And then in orbit around it, you can kind of see our tiny, in comparison, Sagittarius A star, that's only about 4.3 million masses of the sun, which I think makes our black hole roughly around 30 to possibly 40 times bigger than our own sun. And that's of course just the size of the shadow that you see right here, whereas the supermassive black hole in M87 would be much, much larger than the entire solar system, covering billions and billions of kilometers. 
And because of this, M87 looks larger in the night skies, despite the distances. At the same time, because M87 is a smaller black hole, everything around it moves much faster and there's a lot of activity here. But in order to produce a very accurate image of a black hole, you'd really want things to move really slowly, because in some sense it's kind of like doing what's known as long exposure photography when you're trying to capture something for a long time in order to get a really really accurate image. Because of this it works well with M87 but doesn't work as well with Sagittarius A star. And so for over a decade the brilliant scientists from the Event Horizon Telescope, whose website by the way you can find in the description below, have been desperately trying to create this first image of a black hole which they were able to deliver to us despite certain setbacks back in 2019 and the world could not get enough of it. But two years later, basically now, we have a new study that made this image even more interesting, at least for the scientists. They were able to create this right here. And this is a slight difference in what you're looking at. Specifically, those stripes represent what's known as polarized light. Now, you might be familiar with polarization already, and if you're not, well, it sort of is this. It refers to the light having a polarity. Now, normally objects like the sun, for example, will produce light in all sorts of orientations of polarization, and so we normally refer to this as unpolarized light. In some sense, it's basically very, very random in terms of polarization. When this light strikes an object, though, it does have a tendency to sort of reflect some light, some polarized light, more than others. And this often helps scientists, for example, studying asteroids to determine what's present on their surface. That's, of course, just one of the applications here. Also, we know that certain effects, such as magnetism, can usually polarize light as well. And more specifically, let's just say, for example, we're looking at the location around the sun and we find a location where a lot more polarized light is coming from there compared to some of the other areas. The only reasonable explanation here would be an increase in the magnetic field or the electromagnetism in that particular region around the sun. So polarized light is a very important indication of various magnetic effects. And by looking at different types of polarization and the strength of polarization of light, scientists can usually determine the amount of magnetic field present somewhere. One of the better examples from the last few years is this absolutely mind-blowing image of a galaxy known as NGC 1068, taken by the incredible SOFIA telescope, which is basically a telescope inside an airplane, that is able to observe various types of polarized light from really far away. And so here you can see by observing the polarization, the scientists were able to create the magnetic field lines of this galaxy. And something very similar using very similar technique was also created by looking in the center of our own galaxy. This is actually the image of the magnetic field very close to Sagittarius A star. And here's another one showing the Milky Way galaxy with the Milky Way itself being right here and the very, very obvious magnetic lines traveling across the galaxy visible from the location where we are, which is of course the solar system. But now using a somewhat similar technique but using very different telescopes and specifically once again using the similar telescopes that were used originally, the scientists were able to observe the polarization of light relatively close to the black hole in the M87 galaxy and they were able to create the image that you see right here and also observe the polarization at slightly farther distances and even going as far as about 1300 light years away from the center of the galaxy. With this jet right here now being represented by this beautiful polarization image that shows us something that's roughly around 5000 light years long, specifically showing us how magnetic field seems to change throughout the jet as it travels away from the black hole. And that's essentially the most important part of the discovery. It confirms that the black holes have really, really strong magnetic fields, very likely produced by the interaction of the accretion disk that orbits the black hole itself. And these incredibly strong magnetic fields are present both at the edge of the black hole, visible in this image right here, and seem to be present even farther away from the black hole as the astrophysical jet emanates from the center which is a really important piece of evidence in trying to explain how these astrophysical jets form. It still is a mystery. It's still not entirely clear today, but most of the modern studies suggest that it is produced through the interaction of the magnetic fields and the snapping of magnetic lines which actually launch the material in a very similar way that it's launched from our own sun when, for example, a very large coronal mass ejection occurs because of the snapping of the magnetic lines that you see right here. But for a black hole, the magnetic lines are much stronger and the material released is usually released very close to the speed of light. 
while at the same time also suggesting that magnetic field lines here regulate and most likely even assist or prevent the black holes from, well, eating too much. They essentially regulate how the matter distributes around the black hole and seem to be even responsible for directly increasing the mass of a black hole or stopping the black hole from growing. And this doesn't really come as a surprise because even early stars, when they're just kind of growing and becoming more massive, are often regulated by tremendously powerful magnetic fields around them where the magnetic lines themselves occasionally cause the stars to suddenly engulf a huge amount of matter, which often results in the sudden burst of activity around the star. This has been seen by scientists around early stars on many different occasions, so it's very likely a very similar mechanism to how a typical black hole grows as well. Although that's obviously not a fact, just sort of a speculation based on the observation of how magnetic fields seem to interact with stars as well. And on top of this, several other studies suggested that the jets themselves, as they propel away from the black hole, end up slowing down some of the other matter, specifically gas that's slightly farther away from the galaxy, which then causes this gas to slowly make its way toward the center, toward the black hole, and thus add even more material for the black hole to eat later. So the larger the jet, the more likely that this jet is going to be strong enough to cause even more matter to slowly come toward the center and thus increase the size of the jet even more. And the magnetic fields very close to the black hole are apparently strong enough to easily push away some of the extra material from falling too quick into the black hole, so there's a very interesting interplay here between the sudden burst of black holes and also the ability of the magnetic field to prevent the black hole from growing completely. And that's of course something that's really fascinating, but nobody really knows how it works just yet. And so definitely a super fascinating study that will hopefully help us explain how the black holes get so massive, how astrophysical jets are produced, and also what just generally happens around these black holes to begin with. But also, before I finish this video, I wanted to clarify something that a lot of people do seem to confuse a little bit. So what you're looking at right here is not really a black hole itself. First of all, this is a statistical recreation based on a somewhat complex algorithm created by the team from the MIT that shows us the most likely image produced after years and years of observation from these particular telescopes. It's not really exactly a one-to-one -one image at all. It's a statistical recreation. At the same time, this black part in the middle, that's also not really a black hole. That's what we call a shadow, a shadow of a black hole. And the shadow itself is almost three times as large as the so-called Schwarzschild radius. That's what you would call the black hole. So in other words, the actual black hole is somewhere in the middle of this. What you see on the outskirts, that's the area or the volume around the black hole where a lot of light gets trapped and sort of orbits around it and is unable to escape. It never really falls into the black hole or possibly might even escape one day, but it's also not really showing us anything because it's stuck in this orbit. And that's what we refer to as the black hole's shadow. This black hole on top of this today has an unofficial name from Hawaiian mythology. It's known as Puehi, which stands for the adorned, fathomless, dark creation. And I think that suits it pretty well. Also, this ring that you see right here is pretty large. It's about one tenth of a light year or over 700 times the distance of Earth from the Sun. So this is a pretty large object. And it's also spinning really fast at about 40% the speed of light. At the same time, this image right here also provides a little bit more detail about the one-sidedness of the magnetic field around the accretion disk. Which of course implies that the entire system here spins really fast with a lot of power. And this of course also probably introduces a lot of other effects we can't even imagine right now. But unfortunately for now, that is all we know. It's a pretty exciting discovery, it's also a pretty exciting new chapter for this black hole, but for years to come we're going to be learning so much more about it. What the scientists at the EHT were able to achieve is one of those groundbreaking, mind-blowing achievements that, well, a lot of scientists dream for for decades. And so chances are we're going to be talking about this black hole in some near future because I'm sure more discoveries will be coming right after the study comes out. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about a discovery coming out of a very strange cluster that orbits our own galaxy. A star cluster known as Palomar 5 with orbit visible in this picture right here. 
And what makes this cluster extremely unusual compared to everything else we've discovered is that it seems to possess a tremendous amount of black holes on the inside, at least a hundred and possibly a lot more. And so let's talk a little bit more about this unusual discovery and what exactly this means and discuss these clusters in general. First of all, our galaxy has roughly around 150 different global clusters around it. Without exception, all of these clusters are extremely old, usually at least 10 billion years old, meaning that many of them were produced when the galaxy was just being created. And generally speaking, we can usually use these global clusters to measure the age of different galaxies as well while at the same time also discovering some of the details of various galactic collisions that happened to Milky Way and to some of the nearby galaxies as well. But generally speaking, star clusters and global clusters sort of look like this. But some of them, over time, because of the gravitational interactions with the Milky Way or possibly interactions with the mysterious dark matter that's located all over the halo of the galaxy, some of these clusters over time start to kind of stretch and experience tidal disruption with this illustration right here roughly showing us how all of this happens. So after about a billion years, a typical global cluster will generally start to acquire two different tidal tails on both sides. And as it orbits around the galaxy, the tails eventually stretch, forming very beautiful formations, which within only about 5 billion years creates something that looks like this. And in the past decade or so, we've discovered quite a lot of these formations because of the advancements in various telescope technologies, and today we refer to these formations as stellar streams. This one right here was discovered back in 2007. But some of these streams are also formed by different galaxies, specifically dwarf galaxies, and this is kind of what the scientists believed Palomar 5 to be at first as well. Over time they realized that it was just too small and not massive enough. And with further measurements they realized that this was basically a globular cluster you see right here that's being tidally stripped apart by the powerful gravitational forces from the Milky Way galaxy. But there are a lot of features that make Palomar 5 kind of unique and different from other clusters. First of all, it's about 10 times less massive than other clusters, and it's at least 5 times longer than a typical global cluster we're familiar with, making this a cluster that's about to become a stellar stream. It's not one yet, but it's definitely going to be one. And a lot of new observations coming from this cluster do suggest that what you're looking at right here, these are stars escaping the cluster itself. With the stream itself already being about 5,000 masses of the sun and approximately 30,000 light years long, which is slightly longer than the distance of the center of the galaxy to planet Earth that you see right there. Now the cluster itself is right here about 60,000 light years away from the galactic center. But since it only recently started to become flattened and stretched by the gravitational forces, it implies that either A, it was captured relatively recently by the Milky Way, or B, it was in a very different orbit around the Milky Way galaxy. So in other words, something might have actually changed its orbit, causing it now to fall through the Milky Way galaxy and thus become entirely disrupted. But unlike other clusters and unlike other tidal streams, what makes Palomar 5 extremely unusual is an extremely high number of black holes located on the inside. About 20% of the entire mass of the cluster is basically black holes. With most black holes being about 20 masses of the sun or more, and at least 100 of them present somewhere in the center of the cluster itself. And since it's believed that all of them were produced by exploding very massive stars billions and billions of years ago, it's not entirely clear why this particular cluster seems to have way more black holes than any other cluster we've found so far, with potentially one explanation being that maybe there were just a lot of really massive stars to begin with. Maybe initially this cluster just had a lot of different stars that turn into all of these black holes, with an average mass of a star just being higher than in other clusters. But there are a few more things that make Palomar 5 really unusual. Now, first of all, this is so far the only cluster directly associated with a stellar stream. Other stellar streams already sort of exist, but we don't really know which cluster might have actually formed them. And so because of this, Palomar 5 might explain a lot of things about stellar stream formation, while also helping us understand what happens to global clusters when they're tidally disrupted by various galaxies. The other unusual discovery about the cluster is, of course, in regards to its future. 
which sort of relates to the explanation of how this is possible. So first of all, a lot of this was based on trying to simulate various orbits while changing various parameters in the cluster until the scientists found a good match between the observations and between the theoretical predictions. And the simulations here suggest that the cluster very likely started like this. But over time, because stars were more likely to escape the cluster than the black holes, the number of black holes started to increase, yet the number of stars started to decrease. While at the same time, because there were more and more black holes in the center of the cluster, the gravitational interactions between stars and these black holes forced a lot of these stars to move to the outer parts of the cluster or to eventually escape completely. And as more and more stars started to escape from the center and to develop this stream that we see right here, the only things that were sort of staying on the inside were hundreds and hundreds of different types of black holes. And as more black holes appeared, more stars would disappear with time, eventually turning this place into a collection of black holes and no stars whatsoever. But because of this unusual discovery, the scientists also imply that many such dissolved clusters probably already exist around the Milky Way galaxy. But unlike a typical global cluster, these would be dominated by just black holes and maybe some neutron stars, but mostly black holes. They would also be almost impossible to detect with the only potential sign of their existence being some leftovers of ancient stellar streams that might be discovered in some of the future studies. But this also might help the scientists answer the questions about other stellar streams that are orbiting the galaxy right now. The origin of some of them is not really well known yet. More importantly, this also helps us understand or helps us realize that a lot of different black hole collisions, especially the ones we've been detecting in the last few years, might also be coming from these global clusters that would be otherwise invisible to most telescopes. So the large population of black holes in this case does actually imply that there's a high chance of collision between them at some point in the future. But since we can't really see black holes and since we can't really discover them in any other way, it's almost impossible for us to figure out how many such clusters exist already and also how many black holes are there to begin with. Now the simulation here implies that it's maybe over 100, but that's just a simulation. In reality, we don't actually know. Nobody has any idea on how to measure the amount of black holes in these clusters. But in this study, the scientists do use a mathematical analysis and sort of find a way to maybe estimate the number of black holes by just looking at how many stars are being ejected from the cluster compared to the ones that stay in. And so in that sense, it is a pretty interesting analysis and a pretty interesting study. But unfortunately, there's not much else we know about either the cluster or the black holes in this cluster. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about a somewhat unusual and currently unexplained detection coming from an entirely new system that's supposed to detect high-frequency gravitational waves. The types of waves we've talked about previously many, many times. But this time, it's something different and something really difficult to explain. So let's talk a little bit more about this, starting with the idea of what creates these waves to begin with. So since 2015, since the original detection from the LIGO observatory that was able to confirm the collision between two black holes, we now have detected quite a lot. We've detected collisions between neutron stars, between black hole and neutron stars, and some collisions that even today do not have a good explanation. But all of these concepts come from the initial propositions by Albert Einstein, the propositions involving extremely massive and usually very dense bodies that can be so powerful that they even start to oscillate or create these wave formations in space-time itself. Something that we do not sense, but something that we can detect by using very specialized detection devices. And obviously the most famous such device is the LIGO detector. The way it operates is relatively simple. It contains these 4 km long laser lines that shine a light at exactly the same spot. But if something somehow contracts the space-time between these lasers, we'll start detecting various interferences in this part of the device, which can then be interpreted as the potential gravitational detection. In this case, a gravitational wave detection. And since 2015, many such detections have been confirmed, and many such discoveries have allowed us to understand that the universe is full of these different collisions. But LIGO unfortunately is limited to the types of frequencies it can detect. At the moment, it's only able to detect frequencies of anywhere between 10 Hz and about 10,000 Hz, 
which usually corresponds to the collision between solar mass black holes, neutron stars and so on. But for more massive collisions, such as between two supermassive black holes, we would have to have something entirely different. Unfortunately, LIGO is not able to detect those. Some of the previous studies using pulsar detections have actually been able to identify potential collisions between supermassive black holes and extremely low frequency waves, but none of this has been confirmed so far. The thing is, what about smaller objects? What about some exotic objects such as low mass dense objects or possibly primordial black holes? Black holes that could be a mass of planet Earth or even the mass of the Moon. And this is where this other concept comes into play. Ultra high frequency gravitational waves. Something that actually has a potential for being an incredible technology. So okay, quick side note. There are actually several really interesting papers out there with one included in the description below that suggests we can technically use these high frequency gravitational waves as a very effective way to communicate across really far away distances without anything blocking the communication, simply because gravitational waves tend to pass through everything. As a matter of fact, even though technically SETI usually focuses on electromagnetic spectrum in order to find some kind of extraterrestrial intelligence, it's way more likely that a super advanced civilization would probably use gravitational waves and high frequency gravitational waves for long distance communication. Even though it requires a lot of energy initially, it's a lot more efficient at producing information that doesn't actually disappear over time and is also visible from pretty far away. Anyway, side note, but a very interesting side note, because this could potentially lead to completely new technologies. And so at the moment there is quite a lot of interest in trying to create devices able to detect high frequency, so basically over 10 kHz frequencies of gravitational waves. These detectors already sort of exist, and they generally operate on a somewhat similar principle to what we sometimes have inside the watches we have on our hand. They use crystal oscillators, with the actual detectors in this case being pretty small, but they do require a lot of setup around them in order to basically disregard any additional interference that could be coming from something else. And this new study, as well as the new detector, comes from the Australian ARC Center of Excellence for Dark Matter Particle Physics, or basically the center that's trying to discover particles responsible for dark matter exotic particles, unusual particles, but particles that would be a lot less massive than a typical black hole. And so they created a device that uses the oscillations of quartz, and specifically these coarse crystal disks you see right here, that usually vibrate at high frequencies, to create a device that's able to tell when something interferes with their oscillations. Kind of similar to how LIGO works, but on a much smaller scale. Although unlike LIGO that uses lasers, in this case they used acoustic waves. And so generally when it comes to crystal oscillations, they will basically vibrate at a very specific frequency if electricity is passed through them. This is normally referred to as the piezoelectric effect, and there are a lot of different tools around us today that use this for one reason or another. A lot of these devices are known as bulk acoustic wave devices, are actually used in a lot of telecommunication technology as well, including your smartphones. But in this case, this was connected to something else, an extremely sensitive amplifier they refer to as squid, with all of this then placed behind several radiation shields in order to prevent interference, with all of this also cooled down to very low temperatures in order to increase the energy acoustic vibrations from the quartz. And they ran this for approximately 153 days and performed two different experimental runs. And surprisingly to the scientists, in these first 153 days, it detected two unusual signals that currently do not have a very good explanation. Both signals suggesting some sort of a high frequency gravitational wave effect, or possibly something different, possibly something entirely different. Now, first of all, both of these detections were relatively strong compared to the background radiation. Both of them suggested that something might have happened in these frequencies. With frequencies in this case being approximately 5.5 megahertz, up to about 8.4 MHz. So these are much higher frequencies than what we usually detect from LIGO, where the frequencies are normally around 10 kHz. And so both of these unusual detections right now have several potential explanations, but nothing conclusive just yet. Obviously, the most exciting potential explanation is that maybe it's the detection of somewhat less massive primordial black holes colliding together. In this case, their mass would be probably just a few masses of the Moon, maybe mass of planet Earth. Although all of this will depend on the actual distance, so it's not really certain yet. 
But at the same time, this could be maybe produced by some sort of a charged particle or something else passing through the region where the device was operating. So at the moment, the gravitational waves are not the only explanation. In this case, it can also be due to some sort of a stress buildup inside the crystal or inside the device itself. Maybe this was just due to the release of the stress that suddenly created these unusual vibrations detectable twice throughout 150 days. On the other hand, it could also be due to some sort of an explosion, such as a meteor or some sort of a bolide exploding in the air, which actually would be really interesting to find out, because maybe this is how we can detect more of these events, by using similar techniques and similar devices. So at the moment, it's not really certain. But this could also be some sort of an atomic internal reaction, with just the atoms rearranging or something else happening on the atomic scale. Or, the scientists are really hoping for this particular answer, it could be the detection of some sort of a dark matter particle, or possibly some sort of a candidate that we've been trying to find for many years now. And there are quite a lot of potential explanations here as well. WIMPs, axions, or a lot of other hypothetical particles that have been proposed for many years now. With dark matter or primordial black holes being the most exciting explanations for these particular detection events. But I guess the important part about all of this is that this device seems to work. It seems to detect something, and it does so really well. The scientists will obviously now try to focus on trying to identify exactly what they found, and one of the ways we can actually detect if this is, for example, let's just say a gravitational wave versus a meteor, is by taking the same device and putting it somewhere else on the planet. If this is a meteor, we'll know that the detection from the other device is going to be much, much weaker. And by using several devices, we'll also be able to triangulate where it came from. But if this is a gravitational wave coming from a primordial black hole, in this case, the actual effects will be extremely similar, only delayed by the distance, by the speed of light. And so by combining this particular device with possibly several copies and even several other detectors, such as, for example, a muon detector that's able to sense various cosmic particles coming from various directions, it will take this device and the ability to detect these high frequency waves to a completely new level and potentially might even help us eavesdrop on someone using the gravitational waves to communicate. But that's obviously an extremely big if. The more important part of the study right now is creating a device that's able to listen to these high frequency gravitational waves. But what we'll discover right now is a huge mystery. And though yes, it could be some sort of an alien civilization using extraterrestrial technology, but it could also be some new incredible discoveries when it comes to exotic particles, exotic bodies, or various poorly understood phenomena that we know very little about. And so creation of this device will most likely take us to a completely new level of understanding of space sciences. But I guess until further studies and further discoveries, that's all we know for now. We know something was discovered, as a matter of fact it was found twice, but what it is, nobody really knows right now. It's a mystery, a mystery we'll talk about in some of the future videos. Even though what you see right here kind of looks like a star map, essentially something you would see in the night skies, what you are looking at right now is actually a map of black holes. This right here is the first ever produced map of actual black holes in the night skies. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and let's talk about this new discovery or this new study that came out very recently that essentially created this, the relatively small yet somehow extremely huge map of the black holes in the night skies. But first of all, let's start here with the size comparison. As you can see, this little circle represents the size of the moon, and this huge chunk produced by the scientists is essentially what they were able to create with each and every single dot being essentially a supermassive black hole somewhere far, far away. The brighter the dot, the more likely the mass of the black hole. And every single one of these approximately 25,000 or so dots is basically a black hole that's consuming a lot of mass, producing really, really large astrophysical jets and also producing a lot of emissions in different frequencies, including emissions coming from the accretion disk. So in other words, we're not really looking at black holes that would seem very similar to this one, these so-called stellar mass black holes. What we are actually looking at are most likely these giant black holes often located in a typical center of a galaxy. Obviously, not all of them are probably in the center of the galaxy and some of them might actually allow us to study certain mysteries of the universe, but the vast majority of dots in this picture 
are basically these central black holes in different galaxies. But I guess in some sense this is kind of counterintuitive. I mean, we do believe that black holes do not allow light to escape. So how this light is produced is of course a pretty interesting question. And in general we think that this is produced in the accretion disks, not really in the black holes themselves. So essentially this is really what we're looking at. We're looking at these very powerful frequencies, very powerful light coming from the accretion disk close to the black hole. And generally depending on the energy and also depending on the distance from the black hole, different frequencies of light will be produced. And in this particular case, what we're looking at are essentially radio frequencies. Here's actually what all of this looks like if you were to look at the unprocessed version. Or basically if we were to look at the raw data with one object in particular being extremely bright. And this object is very well known to us. The galaxy that we see right here known as 3C295. A relatively small radio galaxy that also surprisingly is extremely powerful and also possesses a tremendous amount of mass. As a matter of fact, it's believed to be one of the most massive galactic clusters and galaxies in the universe, at least as of a few decades ago. And so many of these objects and many of these different galaxies became visible to us by using this new technique that the scientists developed. But the thing is, this took years and years of work. And years and years of observation using Europe's LOFAR, Low Frequency Array. But it's not just one telescope like you see right here. This is literally a Europe-sized radio telescope. And this network of telescope contains roughly around 20,000 different radio antennas forming what's known as interferometric network, with roughly around 52 different locations across Europe. So basically this is an extremely accurate and relatively large in size telescope, but does rely on a lot of observation from several different spots in Europe, with many as you can see right here being present in Netherlands in the so-called LOFAR core. But generally, the accretion disks of black holes are able to produce a lot of different frequencies. And because of this, the scientists had to focus on one frequency that they know would not have any interference and would be sort of visible through the atmosphere of planet Earth. A lot of frequencies, like for example ultraviolet frequencies, get absorbed by Earth. For example, in this image from NASA, we can kind of see the what's known as atmospheric opacity or essentially which frequencies can usually go through the atmosphere. And so here, as you can see, certain frequencies of light, visual light, do go through to some extent. But the infrared spectrum, the higher energy light such as gamma rays and x-rays, and some of the extremely long wavelengths of radio light are not able to penetrate our atmosphere and essentially get absorbed. However, the majority of radio waves are observable, and specifically there is actually a region right here that hasn't really been explored much. The extremely low frequency radio waves. Now generally some of the previous studies already established that extremely or ultra low frequencies are usually reflected back into space by the ionosphere of our planet. So essentially they kind of bounce off as if it was a mirror. And that's usually below the frequency of about 5 MHz or so. But certain low frequencies, depending on the atmospheric conditions, do go through the atmosphere and can easily be observed from planet Earth as well. And it just so happens that LOFAR is the only telescope on the planet that's able to observe frequencies below 100 MHz and produce really high quality images by using thousands of different radio antenna located in Europe. And for this study, the scientists looked at frequencies of about 42 to 66 megahertz, which were still affected by the ionosphere of our planet to some extent. And because of this, to counteract the effects from the ionosphere and possible disturbances, the scientists had to use a supercomputer to essentially correct any kind of interference or any kind of errors produced by the interaction of radio waves with the ionosphere as it passed through it. This was apparently done every four seconds, and overall, had to be done for about 256 hours, which means that they had to do these calculations over 200,000 times. And following this extremely thorough analysis and a lot of calculations, the scientists were then able to convert all of these radio frequencies into this beautiful image of the patch of the night skies that you see right here, with every one of these points representing a supermassive black hole producing these low frequency radio waves. And once again, this point right here representing that famous galaxy 3C295. 
But because of these corrections for the ionospheric interference, a lot of data was produced on the actual ionosphere as well. And in some sense, this is actually a kind of a double success. On the one hand, we have this new map now, but on the other hand, we also have this data of approximately 250 hours of essentially calculations showing us what happens in the ionosphere as the radio wave light passes through it and interacts with it. More specifically, it might actually allow us to study the effects from the sun. As the ionosphere is affected by the sun, we can actually use this data to now analyze the effects from the solar flares and solar activity on the Earth's ionosphere. At the same time, what this map might actually show us are, well, a lot of undiscovered objects, a lot of objects that have never been seen before, specifically in frequencies between approximately 40 to 50 megahertz. So some of these points that you see right here might be objects we never knew existed until this particular study. We don't really know what they are yet and if they're even there, but this is a possibility coming out of this particular discovery. And since this survey here looked at roughly around 1 million different objects, it's obviously going to be really important to see if we can actually find some kind of a new object nobody ever knew existed. But until we know what's here and until we know what's not here, for now all we have is the actual map and honestly it looks kind of beautiful. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to talk about a very interesting concept of tremendously or stupendously large black holes. Black holes so large that they sort of defy our expectations and go beyond the limits of how big we thought black holes can get. But more specifically, we're going to talk about the idea how these black holes can also explain a lot of mysteries in the universe. Things like, for example, the mysterious dark matter, things like, for example, certain quasars and certain galaxies that otherwise don't really make any sense. But to start, let's actually talk about the idea of how massive black holes can get to begin with. Do black holes have a size limit? Is there actually a point at which a black hole sort of stops growing and becomes the largest black hole in the universe? Well, the answer to that is kind of yes, but also kind of not really. Yes, there is a limit, or at least there seems to be a limit based on all of the observations of what we've seen around us in the universe. No, not really, because hypothetically, black holes can actually grow indefinitely. For example, in this simulation, we have five different black holes from a really small one, only a little bit more massive than the sun itself, up to the size of Sagittarius A star, the central black hole in the middle of our own galaxy. This one here is about 4.3 million masses of the sun, and in terms of the radius, or specifically the radius of the shadow that you see right here, that's about um, 19 times bigger than the sun. But quick clarification, what you're looking at here is not the famous event horizon. This is just the shadow of the black hole, with the event horizon being a little bit closer than that. And the difference between the event horizon and the shadow is not really that large. The event horizon is that area around the black hole where nothing can escape anymore. That's basically where even light sort of falls into the black hole and can no longer escape. But the shadow starts a little bit farther away in the innermost stable orbit, where even light sort of starts orbiting around the black hole and is unable to escape. And this produces the shadow around the event horizon. With the most famous shadow being this one right here, M87 star black hole. But because we understand that a lot of black holes will have very similar structures, including the accretion disk that you see right here, we also believe that they mostly grow using the same mechanism, essentially by absorbing the gas and the matter that orbits around the accretion disk, and slowly growing larger and larger as a lot of this mass starts to fall into the black hole, creates the disk around it, and eventually all of this stuff makes its way toward the center of the black hole, adding to its total mass. Now that's kind of what we believe happens in most of the black holes, if not all of the black holes, with some black holes of course also growing through the mergers, but these mergers are not really as frequent as for example various events where gas gets to be deposited inside the black hole. But a few years ago scientists started to ponder how big can black holes get theoretically, and they came up with an answer of about 10 billion masses of the sun. Essentially, they believe that around 10 billion masses of the sun, the growth of the black hole becomes almost impossible and the black holes shut down the productivity around them and basically stay relatively stable at that mass of around 10 billion masses. Naturally, it didn't really take that long for someone to discover a black hole that was a lot more massive than the predicted limit. 
And we've discovered quite a lot of them, with the most recent one being the relatively nearby Holmberg 15A star, the black hole in the middle of this particular galaxy you see on the screen. It's been calculated to be about 40 billion masses of the Sun, which sort of makes this about four times the mass of the original limit. And after all of these studies from the last few years, a lot of these scientists started to recalculate this limit, discovering that it's maybe about closer to 50 billion masses of the Sun. And we started to refer to these black holes as ultramassive black holes, with many of these ultramassive black holes becoming so ridiculously large and so ridiculously massive that they would actually start to swallow up the stable part of the accretion disk, reaching sizes that would be several times larger than the solar system itself. And because of these ridiculous sizes, the accretion disk would just be unable to form around these black holes, thus not allowing the black hole to grow any larger. So, theoretically at least, or in terms of mathematics, the size limits seem to have been around 50 billion masses of the Sun. We know that at least one black hole out there, Ton618, which I mentioned in one of the previous videos, seems to beat this limit as well. The current estimate suggests that Ton618 is roughly around... here we go, here it is... 66 billion masses of the Sun. Now, we don't really know if it's exactly that big or if it possibly is even bigger than that, but the point is that we keep discovering different black holes that seem to defy our expectations and defy our mathematical calculations. Which is also a very important factor here because we do want to understand how all of these very massive black holes form and what actually made it possible for them to exist. Now, one of the possible explanations, of course, is that it was through various collisions with other massive black holes. But that would require a lot of collisions, and that would also require a lot of mass from various nearby galaxies. We've never really seen something like this happen, and because the universe is only about 13.8 billion years old, it's unlikely that so many collisions would happen in a single galaxy so quickly. On the other hand, we've also been discovering some really massive black holes in these very bright but also very young quasars. I've talked about one of these quasars relatively recently, where it was discovered to be about 1.6 billion masses of the Sun in a galaxy that was only a few million years old. And that kind of also doesn't make sense. How can such a massive galaxy, or such a massive uh, quasar that is, form so early on in the universe? And all of these questions possibly have one single answer. The answer that was recently argued in the paper that, as always, you can find in the description below. It was essentially a proposition of a new type of a black hole known as stupendously large black holes. And the idea here is far from original, far from being new. The main proposition suggests that all of these black holes were created in the beginning of the universe. They are what's known as primordial black holes. Originally proposed by the famous uh, Soviet scientist, Soviet astronomer, Yakov Zeldovich, and further elaborated by the famous Stephen Hawking. And the main point here is that in early universe, there was a lot of density distribution with some regions being a lot more dense than others. Those high density regions had a very high chance of suddenly collapsing into an extremely massive object. But as the universe cooled down, instead of becoming stars, instead of becoming massive galaxies, those tiny super density regions suddenly became these really, really massive black holes with some black holes obviously being a lot more massive than others, yet some other black holes being very, very low in mass. And so there was this huge population of primordial black holes that formed across the entire universe. Now, Stephen Hawking back in the days argued that this is how we can actually explain the mysterious dark matter. By having these primordial black holes everywhere in the universe and just being relatively difficult to detect, we would actually have just enough mass formed to explain the conditions for the universe to behave the way we see it behave. So in other words, primordial black holes is one of the potential explanations for dark matter. But what's more is that these primordial black holes also allow us to explain some other mysteries. Such as, for example, how ultra-massive black holes formed so early in the universe. In the last few years, we've discovered several different quasars, these really distant objects that are extremely bright and have an extremely powerful black hole in the middle, where the black hole doesn't actually have any explanation. It's too massive to exist so early in the universe. But if this black hole was created as a primordial black hole, it would totally suddenly make sense. It was already massive when the galaxy started to develop. 
And so in the study, the scientists go through a lot of detail determining, at least mathematically, how such unusual black holes could form, how large they could get, and most importantly, how we could possibly discover them. Now, in terms of the discovery, we still haven't obviously found any, but mathematically, these objects do make sense and they can definitely exist out there. Most importantly though, they do explain a lot of these unusual observations in the universe, including black holes that otherwise make no sense. And what's more is that this presents us with a completely open limit now, basically almost no limit. The black holes can now be 100 billion masses of the sun, but chances are they're going to be completely isolated from anything. They might be in the middle of a galaxy, but they're not going to have an active galactic nucleus because they're not going to be able to essentially create the accretion disk anymore. At the same time, many of them can also be completely isolated from everything, and some of them, even if they do get certain gas near them and will start producing some kind of energy, will actually produce so much galactic wind that all of the other gas will simply get blown out of the galactic system. They will be left with nothing to consume and will most likely maintain their mass and their size for billions of years. But this also means that we could hypothetically find a black hole somewhere out there that's going to be trillions of masses of the sun, possibly even hundreds of trillions. This is something that we can't even truly imagine right now, but at least according to this paper, it totally makes sense now. But also theoretically, we're going to have trouble seeing it. We might be able to observe it through various gravitational effects, but it's not going to be producing the same types of radiation and also same types of emissions as typical quasars and typical active galactic nuclei. In other words, it's a very mysterious and also a very fascinating topic that one day we might learn more about. For now though, it's basically in the realm of mathematics and in the realm of theories. Not really factually proven yet. However, since we've already discovered black holes that sort of beat previous limits, including TON 618, which seems to be 66 billion masses of the sun, all of this already means that we need to sort of rethink how we think about black holes and rethink the idea behind their formation as well. As a matter of fact, one of the recent uh, studies that came out not so long ago even suggested that some of the recent observations from Nanograph that I mentioned in one of the previous videos do actually imply that planet Earth is currently being pulled and pushed around by all of these gravitational waves from a lot of these stupendously large black holes as they collide with one another, or as they orbit around one another creating gravitational waves. And all of this of course suggests that there are these giants somewhere out there that might be invisible to us that could be orbiting around one another creating all of these effects we're observing from planet Earth but not truly understanding what is it that we're detecting because our theories haven't really caught up with the observations just yet. Nevertheless, all of these discoveries are absolutely fascinating and in the next decade or so, we'll probably have clear answers about everything that's happening here. Is it black holes or is it some other phenomenon? Do these stupendously large black holes truly exist or is it just a theoretical fantasy? and possibly even discover some other massive black holes out there that can help us understand how the universe was formed in the beginning, how various black holes came to be, and how large these giants can truly get. For now, nobody really knows, and so the science is going to try to discover all of this in the next few decades. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about a discovery of a very peculiar supermassive black hole in a galaxy far, far away. A supermassive black hole that seems to be producing these very periodic flare-like explosions that don't actually have a very good explanation just yet. Explosions that generate just the same amount of power as a typical supernova does. But because these flares appear to be periodic and also because they seem to have a pattern of about 114 days, it does suggest that this has something to do with something else orbiting the supermassive black hole and most likely producing these effects. So let's talk a little bit more about this discussion because this is actually somewhat unusual and somewhat interesting. And the first thing I wanted to mention is just these black hole flares in general. We know that a typical black hole, even if it's not very massive, is able to produce a lot of different types of flares with some of these flares being produced as a lot of different types of radiation is reflected through the accretion disk, which can kind of act like a mirror to certain types of frequencies. But some other flares being a result of all sorts of magnetic and electromagnetic interactions by the material and the black hole itself. Mostly because all of this has a lot of magnetic charge, including the black hole itself that does possess charge as well. And so just like our sun has these magnetic interactions that result in solar flares, 
This is of course based on the magnetic line interaction. Something similar can happen around massive black holes as well, with obviously a lot more energy being released, with some of these flares being visible from really, really far away distances. Now, we do have example of this from Sagittarius A star, from the supermassive black hole in the middle of the Milky Way galaxy. We know that there's a lot of interaction of various types of materials in this particular system, and the thing is, we do detect certain flares. And one such large flare was detected only a few years ago, and it doesn't really have a very good explanation just yet. And so these flares can be visible from really far away distances. But we think that most of the time it's because certain types of gas or certain types of material possibly either gets really really close to the accretion disk and kind of interacts with it, producing these really large nuclear explosions, or maybe even gets trapped inside the black hole, which also releases a lot of energy. And so detecting these random flares here and there, and also seeing these really bright flashes once in a while, is actually kind of normal. What is, however, unusual is if these flares start having patterns, if you can start being able to predict them, because that's not something we can easily do right now. For example, for the supermassive black hole in the middle of our own galaxy, we have no idea what it's going to do in the next few days, in the next few months, or even in the next few years. But we also know that it did have a lot of powerful emissions in the past. And so trying to predict them and trying to understand them is obviously quite important. But then once in a while we discover something unusual in another galaxy. And this time it's in this galaxy you see right here known as ESO 253-3. It's located roughly around 500 million light years away from us. And roughly around 6 years ago, back in November of 2014, the automated system known as Assassin or All Sky Automated Survey for Supernova was able to detect a potential supernova in this region. In other words, a potential supernova was detected in the middle of this galaxy. But this type of a flare in event and this type of an activity is not really unusual. We've been detecting supernova for a very, very long time. As a matter of fact, as of today, it detected 1183 different supernova using an automated series of telescopes around the planet. But one of the first detections was that particular supernova back in 2014. Okay, it wasn't really the first first, it was number 73, but it was one of the first official detections. But a few years later, one of the researchers, whose name is Anna Payne, was doing her thesis and trying to analyze various explosions, various supernova in the night skies. To her surprise, she identified something unusual going on in this particular galaxy. There were 17 different flashes, 17 supernova-like flashes that all had very particular pattern. Pattern that repeated every 114 days and that seemed to be relatively similar, as if something similar was happening in this region every 114 days. With the overall flash becoming extremely bright relatively quick and then slowly fading away for several days and disappearing for 114 days until it comes back and does it again. And that's of course something that we've actually never seen before coming from a supermassive black hole. Such periodicity currently does not have a very good explanation, but there are quite a few and none of them of course involve aliens. First potential explanation here is that, well, maybe what we're looking at is actually related to another supermassive black hole in the center that interacts with the larger black hole. Basically, it's an interaction between two very, very massive and very energetic black holes. This is actually yet another paper that was released by this team, where they were able to identify a second active galactic nucleus in this galaxy. But the major problem with this explanation is that these objects are really far away from one another. They don't actually orbit close enough to have these very predictable patterns that we're observing from this galaxy, so it's most likely not a supermassive black hole partner. The other explanation involves a star possibly passing through the accretion disk and generating a lot of energy when it passes through this region. Now this is a pretty good explanation too, but the problem here is that we should be seeing two such events with two very specific and very distinct types of energy. Mostly because at some point the star will probably have to pass through the other side of the disk and generate something else slightly different from the original type of energy. We don't really see that. Instead, the emissions seem to be more or less the same. Which takes us to the most likely explanation. It's probably a star being stripped apart by the tidal interactions and as it comes really, really close to the black hole, it ends up losing some of its material due to the tidal stripping, and this piece of the star then starts to interact with the accretion disk and the black hole itself. And because in this case, this star orbits with a very high eccentricity, it actually ends up leaving this particular region for at least 100 days before coming back and doing this again. And every single time it passes close to the black hole, 
it seems to lose approximately three masses of Jupiter in, in gas. And this gas then strikes the accretion disk, it then strikes even the black hole itself, and that in turn generates this tremendous amount of energy. And since the mass of this black hole is about 78 million masses of the Sun, which is, I think, about 20 times more massive than the one in the middle of our own galaxy, this also means that there's probably a lot more material and a lot more energy in the system, which allows it to generate these ridiculously powerful flares that do seem to appear as a typical supernova from a distance. And because it releases something like three masses of Jupiter of mass, this mass is enough to essentially create these ridiculously bright explosions. But there are two questions we can really answer right now. First of all, we don't really know how big the star was in the beginning. And second of all, we have no idea how long it's going to go on for. For example, our Sun contains roughly around 1050 masses of Jupiter. This means that if our Sun was in the system and was losing just as much mass every single passage, it means that it would most likely last for roughly around 100 or about 115 years before essentially becoming absolutely nothing. But that's of course if it loses three masses of Jupiter every 114 days. But that's of course our Sun, and it's a relatively small star. Some stars, like for example Betelgeuse, could possibly last for a thousand years. And so in that sense we don't really know what's happening there and how long it's going to keep going on for. But nevertheless, it is a very interesting observation, and the fact that the scientists behind this paper were able to absolutely accurately predict when it's going to happen next is actually what makes the study really interesting. We now know exactly when it's going to happen again, and the next question here is, when is it going to stop happening? Because that's probably when we're going to finally be able to answer what's really going on here and what's really causing all of this. Once it stops happening, we might have a better answer. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about yet another unusual discovery that seems to present us with a solution to another interesting mystery. The mystery of this unusual astrophysical jet that seems to suddenly bend by about 90 degrees and going in a different direction for some unusual reasons. And this is in a galaxy or a galactic cluster known as Abel 3376. And so today we're going to be talking about this paper right here that investigated this cluster, used the supercomputer to simulate some of the effects in this cluster, and pretty much found a really cool technique for discovering magnetic fields in galactic clusters. But first of all, magnetic fields. So today we know that pretty much most of the objects in the universe to some extent will have some sort of a magnetic field around them. So for example, obviously our sun with the magnetic lines creating a lot of different effects on the surface, Obviously, our own planet has a magnetic field that's responsible for protecting the atmosphere and a lot of other things on the surface. But even as we move out of the solar system and start looking around, we start discovering certain effects of the magnetic field there as well. So one local example is the local cloud. It's this unusual formation that's a few light years across that's basically a gas cloud. But the Voyager probes discover that it also seems to possess quite a strong magnetic field which essentially holds this cloud together, and there are a lot of these clouds all over the galaxy. Now the magnetic field here is obviously not as strong as the planet Earth, but it is strong enough to more or less keep this cloud as a cloud for millions and millions of years. But then over the years, as the scientists use various types of polarized light telescopes to try to investigate Milky Way galaxy and some of the other galaxies, they came up with several techniques to see these beautiful magnetic fields in various galaxies near us and of course in our own galaxy as well. So this one here is from Centaurus A with the magnetic lines visible as these structures you see on the picture. And here's sort of what our own Milky Way looks like if you were to try to visualize the magnetic lines stretching across the entire galaxy. And so a lot of these magnetic fields do interact with gas in the galaxy and to some extent guide it and move it around the galaxy, in some cases even helping galaxies grow. But when it comes to some of the strongest and most powerful magnetic fields, there is really no comparison to what we can find in the middle of a typical galaxy. So these supermassive black holes in the middle, with their extremely large and very energetic accretion disks, can usually generate magnetic fields that are so powerful that they end up creating the jets that you see. And so today the explanation for these so-called astrophysical jets is basically ridiculously powerful magnetic lines that snap once in a while producing these jets. And as you might know from some of the previous videos, the material in these jets can move to really close to the speed of light. 
With the most famous such jet being the one from the galaxy known as M87, the galaxy famous for that first picture of a black hole. This jet is about 5000 light years in length and it's also produced by these very powerful magnetic fields near the black hole. But some of these jets can be way way longer and be produced by much stronger magnetic fields. And I've actually talked about some of them in some of the previous videos. But here we're really talking about magnetic fields in general. So it seems that everything in galaxies has magnetic fields. But what about outside of galaxies? What about the intergalactic space? So what about the space between galaxies such as for example in large galactic clusters where there might be a lot of gas and a lot of interaction as well? Would those regions also have magnetic fields? Well, until now, it was pretty much impossible to know. Obviously, there were speculations, but there were no observations. And without observations, it's just a hypothesis. But the scientists behind this study decided to investigate the famous cluster known as Abel 3376, located about 600 million light years away from us. That's particularly interesting because in the middle of this cluster, the most powerful and the brightest galaxy with the biggest black hole seems to have this strange astrophysical jet that suddenly turns 90 degrees and goes in a different direction and also seems to do so on both sides. And that by itself is first of all a mystery, but also an opportunity to study possibly magnetic fields in these clusters. And that's the assumption that the scientists made here. They used the computer simulation to try to recreate some of the effects that a potential magnetic field in these clusters would produce. And by using a supercomputer known as Aterui-2, which is the most powerful astronomical calculations supercomputer, they were able to create a model that more or less showed them what most likely happens in this jet and how this jet is very likely affected by the magnetic field between the galaxies. Realizing that what's happening here is most likely described in this picture. We have these two jets coming from the black hole and then they actually collide with something invisible right here and create a kind of a backflow that then creates the mushroom-like formation we see here and here. But interestingly enough, afterwards some of these particles end up being re-accelerated and moving in this direction, which is also visible here as well. And the most likely explanation here is literally some kind of a very powerful magnetic wall or a wall-like formation with a lot of magnetic force that can literally stop an astrophysical jet in some sense very similar to what you see here. A spray of water that gets bounced off by the asphalt or by the road itself. Which of course means several things. First thing is that now we seem to have a technique to potentially observe and map all of these invisible magnetic fields by using nearby astrophysical jets and the interaction of particles coming from the jets and then somehow redirected by the fields, while at the same time developing a really interesting computer technique that can then recreate some of these effects and obviously allow the scientists to explain what sort of a field might be present in the region and what kind of interaction we can expect from some of the other nearby objects. Or essentially allowing us to now see magnetic fields present outside of galaxies that most likely interact with galaxies in some way or another. Now obviously this here only shows us one of these magnetic layers, but the scientists in this paper speculate that there are probably several different magnetic layers present in between of these galaxies, and by using this technique we can probably start mapping everything, figuring out what sort of a magnetic field all of this forms. And so far the preliminary simulations indicate that the magnetic field is basically sort of C-shaped, like you see right here, with an unusual double formation that you can see forming here that seems to extend all the way across for millions and millions of light years, sort of wrapping this whole galaxy around. And considering the jet here is several hundred thousand light years long, this is a huge structure. You can basically fit several Milky Way galaxies in there. And it also seems to be a relatively strong structure. And so I guess the question is, what exactly formed it? And the explanation that the scientists provide so far is sort of related to the way that the galaxies interact with one another. As they move around and as they sort of pass through each other's regions, they usually leave behind a lot of different wakes, a lot of gas-like formations. You can kind of see some of them in this simulation from the Illustris project. And once these wakes start to form around these galaxies and around these clusters, which by the way also relates to this unusual large Magellanic wake that is created around our own galaxy, and that's also a video you can check out on the channel that should be popping up somewhere right there, 
What this suggests is that these gas formations and these wakes seem to be present in most clusters and very likely have these very powerful magnetic effects. Although this type of an effect is definitely rare, this is something that we haven't really seen very much. Which does suggest that the magnetic field for this particular cluster seems to be extremely strong. And so this unusual comet-like structure that's several million light years across is most likely formed by some sort of a gas discontinuity right in this region that produces these magnetic fields as various types of plasma gas interact with one another. And since the jet particles seem to be re-accelerated in two directions right here, it only reinforces the idea that right in this region there is some major magnetic field interaction very likely formed through some sort of a galactic interaction previously where several galaxies might have collided and created some sort of a density discontinuity. Or in simpler terms, a really really large plasma cloud with a lot of charged particles. In some sense similar to the local cloud I mentioned previously, but with extremely powerful magnetic fields able to redirect an actual astrophysical jet. And so obviously by using a similar technique, the scientists can now start mapping the magnetic fields in other galactic clusters as well, and possibly even start mapping intergalactic space that up until now was more or less invisible to us. Which means that we can now start exploring the previously invisible areas between galaxies and discover what hides between them by studying the effects from these jets striking those regions and possibly being deflected by them. Now obviously this doesn't happen with all the jets and a lot of the jets are just straight and end up producing something like this, but there are definitely a few galactic clusters, usually more massive and ones with a lot of interaction, where some of these jets do form unusual shapes, which means that it will definitely allow scientists to start mapping that space, allowing them to visualize what sort of hides between the galaxies in those regions. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to once again talk about the beautiful black hole known as M87. The black hole with which most of you are already familiar. This became pretty famous overnight, approximately two years ago when the picture was originally released by the EHT or the Event Horizon Telescope team. But unlike this black hole simulated in Space Engine, this image here only shows us what the black hole sort of looks like in radio light. In other words, these are the observations using radio telescopes, and more specifically, using all of these radio telescopes you see on this picture, and by then using algorithms to connect the data into one single image. But what most of us didn't know is that back then the scientists from the EHT decided to collaborate with a lot of other scientists using other telescopes, telescopes like Chandra X-ray Observatory you see right here, Swift X-ray Observatory, the Hubble Telescope, the New Star Space Telescope for High Energy X-rays, the Swift Gamma Ray Mission, Fermi Gamma Ray Telescope, Hess, Veritas, and Magic Telescopes, with the complete list of all of the telescopes available in the paper in the description below. And during that time, during those several months in 2017, they collaborated with all of these telescopes, making sure that all of them were pointed at the black hole, all trying to collect the data at the same time. And finally, after all these years, we have the final analysis and the final observations from all of these telescopes combining the data together. Which for the first time ever allows us to see what this region of space looks like in all of the frequencies at the same time. And so for example, here's what all of this looks like in gamma rays using two different telescopes including Fermi. Then this is what it kind of looks like in the X-rays, this is from the Chandra Observatory. Then we have the images in the optical light taken with Hubble. Then the ultraviolet taken with Swift. The X-rays once again with a different telescope. The gamma rays with a slightly different telescope. And lastly, the radio light with the Event Horizon Telescope. And all of this finally allowed the scientists to investigate this region in a lot of detail, to analyze things and to understand things from different perspectives. And most importantly, it also allowed them to kind of start answering some of the questions that were kind of mysteries for a long time. But more importantly, it allowed them to create this beautiful animation, this video, which now sort of shows us what it looks like if you were to zoom out of this region with various observations from various telescopes in various uh, types of light. So all of this starts with radio wave observations using different telescopes and you'll see how even the radio waves here will actually look very different from what we originally imagined them to look. 
And then as you start zooming out, you get to see the uh, very powerful astrophysical jet. This is still in radio waves and it becomes even more pronounced farther away from the black hole. And eventually we'll start seeing some of the other observations from some of the other telescopes, but this is to show you how extremely detailed these radio observations were. And so here we get both X-rays and optical all together, with the optical light being in the middle and the X-ray observations being on the right. And interestingly, though they look the same, the actual energies are coming from different locations. And lastly, the last observations, the least detailed observations, are the ones in the gamma rays. And because most of these telescopes were just space telescopes and did not really have very high resolution or ability to see very far away, this is why you only get to see radio waves with a lot of detail. The radio observations came from a telescope that was practically the size of our own planet, whereas all of the other telescopes like Hubble and Fermi telescopes, their resolution usually was limited to either the size of the mirror or the size of the sensors inside a telescope. And so we mostly have the high resolution observation of the black hole only in radio waves, but we get to see the regions nearby in other frequencies, and most importantly, we actually get to see the astrophysical jet and all of the relevant information about it in all of the frequencies all at once. And that's really what the scientists are trying to solve right now. And mostly because there are still a lot of mysteries in regards to this jet. For one, how is it actually generated? A lot of theories do suggest that it's probably something to do with extremely powerful magnetic fields and very very powerful magnetic lines that sort of twirl around the black hole forming in such a way that essentially when they snap everything starts coming out in two directions and extremely extremely fast. And in case of this black hole the material here is moving at a speed of about 99% of the speed of light. Interestingly, because it's sort of moving toward us, it's also creating this unusual effect I've discussed in one of the previous videos that essentially makes it look like it's moving like six times the speed of light. This is a kind of a visual illusion that the scientists are quite familiar with and it's not really violating any laws here. But the origins of these astrophysical jets are still not clearly understood. At the same time, it's not really understood why these different frequencies are produced in these different areas along the jet. So for example, why is it that there are a lot of radio waves seemingly coming from this location and clearly a huge amount of radio waves just coming from this direction in general, but not as much optical light and quite a lot of x-rays, but they also seem to actually not correspond to the radio emissions as much. And so some regions that are visible in one frequency are not going to be as obvious in some of the other frequencies. Whereas some other parts, like specifically this unusual formation that the scientists refer to as not A, seems to be quite apparent in the x-ray emissions, also in the ultraviolet emissions, and in the radio emissions as well. But what's not apparent is why is it that this part doesn't seem to be as prominent in a lot of these observations. And also, what exactly created this? What exactly happened around this black hole? What seems to be maybe a couple of thousand years ago that created these unusual emissions? And a somewhat related question and a mystery to all of this is, of course, in regards to the mysterious cosmic rays that even right now are bombarding us from outer space, but their origins are not entirely understood. So there is a lot of speculations that they're actually coming from the center of these massive black holes, but by being able to identify and actually specifically see them coming out of these astrophysical jets would definitely solve this mystery once and for all. And because a lot of these cosmic rays striking our planet sometimes have energies millions of times higher than whatever we can produce on planet Earth in the most powerful particle accelerators, it of course is a really interesting mystery to solve. What can be so powerful somewhere out there to be able to produce these extremely powerful particles? And also, more importantly for scientists, just getting this picture is of course a great publicity, but it's not really as impressive scientifically because you still want to learn something from this image other than just having the image. And so because of this, observing this location in various frequencies will definitely now allow scientists to pinpoint some of the really interesting discoveries from this region and help them explain what's really happening here and how all of this is produced. And also understand a little bit more about this astrophysical jet that's around 5,000 light years or so in length. Here's actually what the picture of this looks like from the Hubble telescope taken a few years ago, with the jet itself clearly visible in the picture as well. But for us, for humans, it's really hard to imagine what happens in these jets, especially because particles here move so fast, they move close to the speed of light. 
And because of this, the time for them actually slows down. And because the time for these particles slow down to the point where everything happens in slow motion, they don't even get to interact with one another or essentially affect each other in any way until much later in time. And by the time they actually start attracting each other or start interacting in some electromagnetic way, they have already reached really far regions of space. Which is why a lot of these jets end up being almost completely straight. The particles on the inside are unable to do anything until some time later when they finally kind of start feeling each other's effects. With the jet itself sort of falling apart right here at the end, but at really far away distances from the center, in this case it being about 5000 light years. And some jets out there are even longer, they can be millions of light years long if the particles leave the black hole region at even faster velocities. And because in this particular case all of these jets are responsible for a kind of an energy transfer across the galaxy, it's also important to understand how they affect the galaxy itself. And this is, for scientists, the best case to study what happens around the black holes and what happens with these astrophysical jets as well, M87 being the closest galaxy where all of this is quite easily visible. Although, okay, realistically speaking, it's actually Centaurus A, but Centaurus A has a different story coming up in one of the future videos, so it's not really the best to study this. It is, however, a super interesting galaxy in its own right. But right now, only some preliminary analysis has been done on this region in these frequencies. So, for example, one interesting discovery here is that apparently the original observation was done when the black hole itself was extremely low in activity. It was almost dormant. And in that sense, scientists sort of got lucky. They get to see the center of the galaxy and the black hole itself when things were more or less quiet. With a lot of other quiet periods, some of them lasting for hundreds and thousands of years, also visible in some of the other parts of the jet. Another interesting discovery was in regards to gamma rays. So even though there seems to be quite a lot of ultraviolet light, quite a lot of X-ray light, obviously optical light and radio light, when it came to gamma ray emissions, for the most part none of them were detected close to the black hole, but were detected much much farther away from the black hole, so almost like at the tips of the astrophysical jet. And because it's not really clear how the gamma ray radiation is produced in this case, the current assumption that maybe it's produced through the interaction with various cosmic rays, whose origin once again is not really known. But because these gamma rays seem to appear somewhere farther away from the black hole, the exact location where they start is actually a bit of a mystery and why this work is sort of exciting and is important to analyze. By figuring out where the gamma rays are coming from, gamma rays of course being the most energetic types of energy, the scientists might be able to answer some interesting fundamental questions. Although one suggestion so far has been that maybe they are produced inside the inner parts of the jets as those jets interact with the cosmic rays, which would once again confirm the existence of cosmic rays inside the astrophysical jets. But how exactly the gamma rays are produced and what is happening inside the jet is of course one of the mysteries that the scientists are hoping is going to be solved when other teams join in and use the data released very recently to try to come up with some interesting explanation and some interesting theory. For now, I think it's just going to be a mystery. But overall, all of these observations are actually kind of mind-blowing. I believe this was conducted by um, something like 32 different countries and approximately 800 scientists participated in all of this. All of them had to work at the same time, they had to basically come up with the data that would correspond to observations from other telescopes and then they had to combine all of this into a single study. And that's a lot of work. But it's been done and now we have a better picture of all of this and hopefully some answers in the future. When it comes to black holes, I've always been fascinated by the idea that in theory astrophysicists are able to predict what they actually look like way before we can even see them. As a matter of fact, even though the first black hole picture ever was released in 2019, the original simulation showing us what black holes might look like, which is this beautiful image you see on the screen, was originally produced uh, literally 40 years prior, back in 1979, by the relatively famous French astronomer Jean-Pierre Luminet. And interestingly, this first computer simulation was produced by nothing more but a really early computer and a bunch of ink. 
Now, 40 years later, we finally have a confirmation of his ideas, but obviously there were some inconsistencies and you can actually find out more about Luminet and his creation, along with some of the inconsistencies from other simulations, by reading the blog he wrote a few years ago. Anyway, hello wonderful person. So today I actually wanted to focus on another interesting theoretical prediction and theoretical simulation of binary black holes, and this was recently produced by two NASA scientists using a supercomputer that's normally used for various simulations usually involving climate. The two scientists, Jeremy Schnittman and Brian Powell, use this supercomputer that you see right here, known as Discover, to essentially simulate what we can expect to discover if there are two supermassive black holes in orbit around one another. Which of course follows this tradition, at least when it comes to black holes and other mysterious objects, where you kind of start with a theory, then you try to visualize it using computers or a lot of mathematics, and lastly you try to confirm your theory by actually finding real objects somewhere out there, and then seeing if your theory actually matches what you get to see. And for the picture of M87, the theory matched the observations almost entirely. There were some discrepancies, very minor ones, mostly because apparently we were observing this black hole when it was extremely quiet, but overall what the scientists expected to see, they actually did see after all. And so traditionally when it comes to a lot of these exotic objects like black holes and neutron stars, the observations have pretty much always matched the previous theoretical predictions. Which is why trying to push the theoretical boundaries and trying to simulate even more advanced objects is so important. But in this case, the scientists decided to focus on the idea of two supermassive black holes, one being about 200 million masses of the Sun, and the other one being a little bit smaller, 100 million masses of the Sun. And the point of the simulation was essentially to predict what we're going to be able to see if, or hopefully when, one day we discover these objects in a galaxy somewhere far away. But first of all, let's try to understand why this is important. So when it comes to black holes, we know that these so-called stellar mass black holes are pretty much everywhere and we've actually detected quite a lot of them, including a lot of them in collision with one another. That's generally what the Caltex LIGO detector is able to do really well. We've also obviously found quite a lot of supermassive black holes out there, with some really sort of breaking the limits of our understanding. But we've never really seen two supermassive black holes relatively close to one another. We've seen galaxies that do possess two or three supermassive black holes at really far away distances, here we're talking about thousands of light years apart, but we've never seen two really close. Specifically close enough where they start influencing one another and where the light interaction and specifically the gravitational lensing interaction actually starts to become an issue. And it's really important to one day find these objects because currently our theoretical explanation for how black holes grow and how galaxies basically kind of grow as well does involve galactic collisions and black holes merging. But there is a small problem with supermassive black holes. It's a paradox, it's known as the final parsec problem. The idea that if the black holes, supermassive black holes come really close to each other, specifically about four light years away from each other, at this point it's going to be really difficult for them to come any closer. They're still too far away from each other to produce any gravitational waves that normally slow down black holes, and they're a little bit too close for various types of materials such as interstellar gas to try to slow them down further, so they basically kind of get stuck in this region. And so, for example, in galaxies like this, where there seem to be two supermassive black holes in the middle, these black holes are still much farther away. And so, we've never really seen galaxies where the black holes are really, really close to one another. Specifically this close. But they have to exist, at least um, that's our understanding of how galaxies evolve. If these galaxies don't exist, if there are no galaxies where black holes are so close together, then something is wrong with our understanding of black hole evolution and galactic evolution. And so because of this, it's also important to understand what we can expect from a galaxy where two supermassive black holes are orbiting really close to one another. We have to understand, for example, what type of different sort of light we're going to see, what sort of light interaction, what kind of different effects we're going to be seeing here, which would be absent if there was just one black hole. And so these simulations are absolutely crucial in order for us to analyze what exactly happens when, for example, two supermassive black holes sort of cross each other. So we're going to be seeing these very unique observations in these uh, systems, but we're not going to be seeing this anywhere else. So that's kind of why this is important. Now, first of all, the assumption here is that these two black holes both have some sort of um, 
relatively large accretion disk like this black hole here, and they also both emit somewhat similar light. But in this case, most of the spectrum is not optical, it's actually ultraviolet light. So sort of what we expect from really large hot stars. With the blue disk, the blue black hole here, emitting slightly higher in terms of temperatures, uh, UV emissions. And for both black holes, we also get to see a very clearly defined shadow of the black hole right in the middle with a really, really small ring right here that you can also find in this image from NASA known as the photon ring. And that's essentially where the photons sort of start orbiting the black hole and in some sense actually get stuck there. They can orbit the black hole two, three, four, or actually multiple times simply because in this particular region, it's possible for light to assume an orbit around the black hole. But because of the slight distortions, some of the light does get to escape at some point. But unlike previous observations, here we also get to see what happens when one black hole passes in front of the other. Notice how the light from the black hole in the back actually gets to be reflected on both sides of the black hole in front. And then something similar happens when the smaller black hole passes in front of the larger black hole. And this of course means that if one day we discover some sort of a galaxy where we actually see these unusual emissions that do suggest some sort of a mirroring effect coming from the center and these emissions seem to repeat very regularly, it of course means that we definitely found some kind of a massive object orbiting another massive object. But for now we haven't found them so we're just going to keep looking. But the other really interesting observation here is usually referred to as relativistic aberration. This is essentially when the black holes actually kind of appear smaller as they approach us, but become slightly larger when they move away from us. So right now, as the blue black hole approaches us, it actually kind of shrinks in size, whereas as the red black hole moves away, it looks bigger in size. And that's essentially the consequence of moving really, really close to the speed of light and the effects that the black holes themselves create in their vicinity. You can actually find more cool examples in regards to this on this site created by Andrew Hamilton of Colorado University, where he actually has some really cool examples of the uh, relativistic aberration, like the one you see right here where the object, even though it's approaching us, kind of appears smaller for just a little bit right before it comes toward us, which is more or less the same reason why it sort of looks the same in this simulation here as well. The other interesting and unusual phenomenon in this case is somewhat difficult to see at first, but it's basically the fact that both of the black holes produce a kind of a copy or in some sense a sort of a reflection of their own partner somewhere inside of the light that's coming from them. Now notice how this uh, blue black hole here is going to sort of shift around, but it's still going to be always there. And something similar is going to happen with the blue black hole with the copy of the red black hole on the inside. And all of these copies of their partners are essentially seen edge on. Or basically, it's the image that's been redirected by about 90 degrees. So in this case, the image that we're looking at is the image of that particular partner, but from a side view. And so here, if this is the front, then this is actually the side view coming from this direction. Which of course is really impressive because it means that if one day we discover this system, we'll be able to analyze a typical supermassive black hole from several different angles at once. Or essentially the system here allows us to kind of recreate the three-dimensional space of the entire black hole. But that's of course assuming that we are sort of positioned in just the right way where the black holes are circling around one another facing us side on. But obviously their positioning could be different. And in this case they simulate those as well. So if for example we're looking at these black holes from the top, we're going to be seeing slightly different effects. And so no matter what angle we're going to be looking at these black holes from, we're going to expect some sort of a reflection coming from the accretion disk of the partner. And once in a while when they align just perfectly, we're going to be able to see several different versions of the image from different angles and showing us different perspectives of the black hole. In this case, it's even possible to align the black holes in just the right way, where they basically literally recreate the three-dimensional image of their partner. Although in this case, these images are going to be very distorted. But today we actually have several techniques to recreate these um, distorted images created by gravitational effects and to then try to form the original image knowing what we know about the gravitational lensing. So technically using a supercomputer, all of this should be possible really quick. Although on a typical computer, such as the one I'm using to record this, even simulating these two black holes orbiting around one another would take close to about a decade. 
And so overall, this is actually a pretty impressive and really important simulation that a lot of scientists studying black holes are going to be using for many years to come. There are obviously some other effects that I haven't covered here. For example, relativistic beaming that both black holes produce as well. And that's the Doppler shift effect, where this side right here is going to be a little bit brighter than the opposite side. This is true for both black holes. That's basically because the light in the accretion disk is moving toward us, so it's slightly brighter, and on the other side it's moving away from us, so it's going to be slightly Doppler shifted and appear slightly darker. I think the original Luminez image is a much better example of this effect in action, so you can kind of see how this is much brighter and there's almost nothing here. So definitely quite an amazing visualization and quite an amazing theoretical prediction of what we can observe once we discover these objects. But for now, the scientists are going to keep looking. It's probably one of the biggest unsolved mysteries of the universe, the mystery being, do supermassive black holes collide, ever? Or do they grow by some other means we haven't really figured out yet? I mean, clearly there are binary black holes in some galaxies, but what happens to them at the end? Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're discussing black holes once again. Another really exciting discovery from another really exciting paper. And this time it's actually a discovery that confirms one of the fundamental properties of black holes. The property that they can actually reflect some of the light back to us. Or in other words, that the light around a black hole can bend so much that the black hole itself becomes sort of like a mirror. Something that was definitely known theoretically, but something that has now been physically shown and physically proven through this recent paper that just came out. But first, what kind of a black hole and where is it located? Well, this is in a galaxy pretty far away from us. A galaxy that's roughly around 800 million light years away. And when observing this galaxy, specifically in the X-rays, the scientists realized something about the center of the galaxy. It was producing a very intriguing pattern of different X-ray emissions with very specific light curves. With one particular flare shown right here being extremely interesting. But it didn't take the scientists long to realize that what they're looking at is actually something that was predicted by Einstein many, many years ago. These were the echoes or the reflections coming from the black hole itself. And not just from any part of the black hole, from behind the black hole. Okay, so here's how you could try to imagine this. For example, today we know that a typical black hole will usually start bending the light in such a specific way that it's going to start producing different observable shapes around the black hole itself. So even though this shows us the front of the accretion disk, we know that this right here shows us the back of the accretion disk. So this is actually a reflection coming from the other side of the black hole itself. But on the bottom here, we also get to see what the bottom of the disk looks like as well. Now on top of this, there are some other features, specifically the feature known as the photon ring that's theoretically believed to exist here as well. But there's actually another video that where I discuss this in more detail. In a nutshell though, the photon ring in this case reflects the entire universe around the black hole. And several versions of these photon rings will produce sort of like the frames, individual frames of what I guess you would call the movie of the universe. But because various simulations and various mathematical calculations always present the black hole as having this funny looking hat and a kind of a beard right here, it's sort of important for us to try to figure out if they really look like this. So do they actually truly reflect the backside in the way that you see in this image? And so obviously, theoretically, the answer is yes. But how do you physically prove this? The best picture of the black hole we have so far is M87. But this image is just not accurate enough to truly show us if there are any reflections coming from this region. And the most recent image produced by the same scientists of the Centaurus A black hole is just not nearly accurate enough to show us anything either. This was actually discussed in another video, but this is what it kind of looks like. It tells us a little bit more about the astrophysical jets, but it tells us nothing about the accretion disk or about the reflections from the black hole. But there is a way for us to see this, even though we cannot see the details of a black hole. It's something to do with another feature of a black hole that's actually not visible in this image. Decades ago, the scientists also predicted that a typical black hole is going to have a region known as the corona. And generally, the way that the corona is produced is when the material from the accretion disk around a typical, very massive black hole sort of starts falling into the black hole, producing a huge amount of energy quite suddenly. This always results in some sort of a massive and very powerful flare. And more often, these flares are formed when there is a sudden increase in the mass that's absorbed by the black hole, 
where the sudden increase in gas sliding into the black hole suddenly increases the temperature right next to the black hole by millions of degrees. And at these temperatures, the electrons start separating from atoms. And this creates a huge amount of plasma right above the black hole. Or actually right above and right below the black hole. And all of this plasma gets caught in the magnetic field of the black hole. And as you can see in this picture, it starts to dramatically get spun up and gets curled and twirled so much that at some point it completely disintegrates creating this beautiful and extremely powerful effect with an extremely bright flash right here. And so this extremely powerful coronal emission, followed by an extremely bright flare, can actually last for a few hours, and depending on the black hole can actually reach really really far up and down from the black hole. In this particular case, the black hole that was about 10 million masses of the sun produced a flare that was about 60 million kilometers in size, roughly one third of the distance of Earth to the sun. But this beautiful flare also produces an extremely bright flash of X-ray radiation. The flash that's so bright that it can be visible from an extremely far away distance. In this case, of course, from 800 million light years away from us. But at the same time, the light from this flash is also reflected from the accretion disk around the black hole. And this reflection can also be visible from the planet. As a matter of fact, in some of the previous studies, some scientists figured out how we can use this reflection to literally map the region around the black hole. It's not super accurate yet, but it's definitely possible and has been done before. And so the scientists in this paper were doing something similar. But while looking at the X-ray emissions from this particular black hole, with this black hole right here being about twice as massive as the one in the middle of the Milky Way galaxy, making it about 30 million kilometers in diameter, they realized that they were looking at some other emissions they didn't really expect. The emissions that were producing some sort of an echo or a reflection. And it didn't take them too long to figure out exactly what's happening here. So essentially, as the coronal flash occurs right here, it starts emitting X-rays going in every direction. Some of them will go to this side, some of them will go to the opposite side. But because they're reflected, we'll get to see reflections from the near side, and since it's a black hole, some of the light from the other side will also get bent and sent toward us as well. And because these additional flashes were much smaller and also seemed to be slightly redshifted, or basically had slightly different color, the only reasonable explanation here was that it was reflected from the back of the black hole and we were literally looking at something that came from the other side. With the time difference between these flashes naturally also explaining how far away the distance between these two points is. Although these new X-ray calculations did suggest that the black hole could have been much smaller, possibly only about 3 million masses of the sun. Which of course means that there are still a lot of unanswered questions. Nevertheless, being able to see all of this at such tremendous distances is still quite an impressive achievement. But hopefully some of the future telescopes with even more resolution, such as for example the Athena Observatory that's going to be operational sometime in the next 10 years or so, is definitely going to allow the scientists to see all of this with so much detail that we might be able to map an entire region around a black hole by using these X-ray echoes coming from a typical X-ray flash. And so there are definitely quite a lot of discoveries that are going to be made in the next decade or so. For now though, it's still quite impressive that this galaxy known as Izwicky 1, also known as Markarian 1502, allowed the scientists to investigate the black hole in the middle and to confirm something that we sort of expected the black holes to have. Their ability to bend light in such a way that we can actually see what's behind them. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about the first black hole ever discovered. The black hole known as Cygnus X1. And more importantly, we're going to be talking about new discoveries in regards to this black hole that actually suggest it's also the fastest spinning black hole we've found so far, and it's the biggest or the most massive stellar mass black hole found in the galaxy, meaning that it has a lot of new records under its name. But we're also going to talk a little bit more about the history of this black hole, because this is probably one of those black holes everyone should know. Assuming that you know what M87 black hole is, you should definitely know about Cygnus X1. And here, let's start with the history. Back in the days before satellites became very common, the scientists used to use these sounding rockets, basically the rockets that you would send into the upper atmosphere and into space as well, in order to conduct all sorts of atmospheric and space research. And in 1964, one of these rockets, this one right here, known as Aerobee, discovered an unusual X-ray source 
and actually an extremely powerful X-ray source coming from the region in the night skies known as Cygnus, the region that's also famous for the very large star known as Deneb. And though at first it wasn't really clear about what this particular source was, about 10 years later in 1974, two famous astrophysicists, Stephen Hawking and Kip Thorne that you see right here on this picture from Caltech, decided to make a friendly bet on what exactly is it that they found. Kip Thorne was convinced that this was a black hole, and this would be the first ever black hole found, confirming the Einstein's theories. Stephen Hawking did not believe so, he thought it was maybe a neutron star, possibly something else. And following several major studies in the 90s, Stephen Hawking conceded that he was wrong, this was indeed a black hole. The first ever black hole discovered, the first ever black hole confirmed. The black hole that you see simulated right here, known as Cygnus X1. Now it doesn't really have a proper name just yet, but it probably will in the future. And what's really interesting about this particular black hole is that it's also referred to as a microquasar, mostly because all of its features, including the accretion disk, the astrophysical jets, and a lot of energies that it's producing are extremely similar to the energies we observe from quasars. The supermassive black holes in the middle of different galaxies really, really far away that often have very similar effects, but on much larger scales. And because of this, Cygnus X1 also became the first ever microquasar. But because most of the radiation produced here is in the X-rays, it actually took a while for us to study all of this. And it wasn't until the 70s when the first ever X-ray satellite was launched, the satellite you see right here known as Uhuru, finally allowed the scientists to study this X-ray object in more detail, while at the same time discovering 300 more similar objects. Some of them ended up being neutron stars, some of them ended up being distant galaxies, others being black holes. But because this object has been discovered several decades ago, it's also the most studied black hole ever. And so it is kind of unusual to have a new study come up with some kind of a detail that we've missed originally. And specifically in this case, what the study discovered is that the mass of this object was actually most likely underestimated along with the total spin of this black hole. By using extremely accurate new observations, using a technique that's actually quite common, known as parallax, the scientists were able to establish that the distance here is about 7200 light years away from Earth, much more distant than we originally thought. This implies that the black hole is about 21 masses of the Sun. It is more massive than we originally thought, making this the most massive stellar size or stellar mass black hole. This is obviously still not the most massive black hole discovered, but it's the most massive smaller black hole. And all of this is thanks to some of the new techniques used in this study that relied on, well, basically an Earth-sized telescope, the network known as VLBA, or Very Long Baseline Array. This tiny image right here kind of shows you the total size of this network, essentially allowing us to have extremely accurate observations. And here's how the black hole compares to our own sun as well. But it's also important to understand that the reason this black hole is so extremely bright and has so many different emissions in X-ray frequency is really because it also has an extremely massive donor star next to it. The star that's about double the mass or about 40 masses of the sun. And this image here illustrates what all of this most likely looks like. We basically have a very large O-type star that's extremely massive and most likely will go supernova at some point as well, with the black hole that's really massive as well, essentially leaching off a tremendous amount of matter, turning it into a very powerful accretion disk, and then emitting all of this light toward planet Earth from a really far away distance of about 7,000 light years. The star itself is known as HGE226868, and is also extremely bright and extremely hot. The temperature here is about 31,000 degrees Kelvin, and it's also about 400,000 times more luminous than the Sun. The distance between these two objects is roughly around 0.2 astronomical units, or about half the distance of the Sun to Mercury, and based on the observation of some of the nearby stars, it's assumed to be about 5 million years old. With the original mass of the star that became a black hole later also being about 40 masses of the Sun. And so the original system of two stars may have looked something like this. We have these two giant stars orbiting around one another, with one of them, the one that's probably a little bit more massive, or possibly the one that stole the most mass initially, going supernova, or potentially collapsing into the black hole directly and turning 
into the invisible partner that currently is known as Cygnus X1. And right after this it started to consume all of this mass from its partner, essentially turning into a micro quasar. Now because these two stars were so close together, the scientists don't really think that there was a supernova, or at least if it was a supernova it probably wasn't very powerful, otherwise the partner star would have been kicked out of the system. And so in order to maintain such a close distance between two objects, the star had to collapse into the black hole without producing much energy. But interestingly, not only is this black hole more massive than originally thought, it also is spinning practically at the limit of how fast black holes can spin. Essentially, the spin here is nearly the speed of light. And that's really unusual, but also extremely interesting. It's definitely going to be producing a lot more studies in the future. And all of this spin is most likely produced by essentially absorbing so much mass. And as all of this mass is absorbed from the star, so is the angular momentum. And all of this angular momentum transfers into the black hole, making it spin even faster. And because the observations here essentially involved looking at the star and the black hole as they made a single orbit around one another, so far it looks like these are the most accurate observations of Cygnus X1 we've ever had. Which also of course implies that this is probably as accurate as it will get for the next few years, and it will probably end up producing a lot of really interesting studies. But for now this is all we know about Cygnus X1, it seems to be a record holder for many different reasons. The most massive stellar sized black hole, the fastest spinning black hole, and also just generally an extremely interesting object. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about black holes once again. And this time we're discussing this very intriguing study that suggests we might have discovered or actually proved observationally that a black hole can hypothetically create more energy than we give it. Something that's currently known as the Penrose process. In other words, it provides the observational proof for the theory that we've had for a very long time that you can hypothetically extract energy from a spinning black hole. But how exactly does all of this work and what exactly is this proof? Well, first of all, the theory behind Penrose process is pretty solid. Mathematically, at least, it definitely makes sense. But it only works for black holes that are spinning, which hypothetically would probably be most of the black holes out there. For example, because of the conservation of angular momentum, as the star shrinks in size and becomes a neutral star, its spin accelerates to the point where it starts spinning thousands of times per second. Which can then obviously become an even smaller object, a black hole that spins even faster. So the black hole spin is something that we believe exists around most black holes. But the thing about spinning black holes is that the faster they spin, the more unusual properties they start to acquire. So even though technically we don't really understand what happens inside the black hole beyond the event horizon, mathematically it's believed to be some sort of a singularity, a tiny tiny point. But when this black hole starts spinning, Mathematically, this actually produces a kind of a ring-like object that sometimes is referred to as ringularity, or ring singularity. And this by itself starts producing some really unusual effects right around the black hole as well. And here is how sort of all of this changes. First it acquires inner and outer horizon, and then it also acquires this area you see right here that's referred to as the ergosphere. An ergosphere is that particular region we are kind of interested in. It essentially is the region where the space-time itself is dragged around the black hole to the point where if you were to sort of be inside the ergosphere, you would be forced to spin with the black hole. There is absolutely no way for you to spin against the flow. And so here is an interesting example of an object falling inside the ergosphere and it sort of becomes impossible for the object to orbit in any other direction. It's forced to go with the flow. And so back in the days, Roger Penrose proposed that, hypothetically at least, it's possible for us to extract some of the spinning energy from this region. Because unlike the event horizon, you could hypothetically escape from the ergosphere. And not just escape from it, but also escape from it by acquiring extra energy and thus leave the ergosphere with more energy than what you had before you came in. And at least theoretically, it's possible to acquire up to about 25% extra energy after leaving the ergosphere. There are of course some caveats to this, like for example, you still have to find a way to leave the ergosphere by somehow losing a part of the mass and thus leaving a little bit behind. But once you leave the ergosphere, the mass acquired and the energy acquired is higher than what you had before. 
And although it might sound like some sort of a weird science fiction phenomenon, apparently it really exists and has actually been proven by using various acoustic equivalents of black holes. I've talked about one major experiment from 2020 in a video somewhere right there that's going to be popping up in the future. And so we know that this extraction of energy from ergosphere is definitely possible, both mathematically and in black holes that were produced using sound effects. But has it actually been observed before? Well, not until now. And this intriguing study you can find in the description below provides an extremely interesting analysis of a gamma ray burst that occurred uh, back in 2019. The most powerful gamma ray burst ever detected. And although back then it wasn't particularly clear what actually caused this gamma ray burst to be so powerful, and even though there were some theories trying to explain all of this, at the moment, this right here seems to provide the most accurate and also the most interesting analysis slash explanation to what most likely happened there. Although previous explanation still applies to this gamma ray burst as well. It's just in this particular study, it's clarified even further. But first, what exactly happened? Well, we've talked about this as well, but essentially back in January of 2019, the scientists detected this very unusual, very powerful, extremely bright gamma ray burst that happened in a galaxy about four and a half billion light years away from us. It also emitted a tremendous amount of different frequencies with the afterglow being detected in all sorts of radiation, including radio waves, gamma rays, x-rays, and so on. And to date, this has been actually the most extensive gamma ray ever. It provided a tremendous amount of data for scientists to study. But it was very difficult to explain what exactly produced such a tremendously powerful gamma ray emission. It was much more powerful than anything previously detected and was very difficult to explain using modern theories. But scientists have tried and succeeded to some extent but some things still didn't really make sense. And so this new team decided to see if they can explain this by applying the ideas from Penrose process to it. So in this case, what they believe might have happened was very likely a result of a tremendous amount of energy being extracted from the ergosphere of a newly created black hole. Now, they believe that in the beginning, this was a binary system where a really old and somewhat powerful neutron star, or possibly even a magnetar, was orbiting around another star that was very likely a massive carbon star, or some sort of a carbon oxygen star. This type of an object is expected to create a new neutron star when it goes supernova. And because these objects also generally don't really live very long, it was only a matter of time before it went supernova. But as this was a binary system already with a neutron star present in the region, all of this created a somewhat easy to destabilize system. And so at some point, the carbon oxygen star goes supernova. When this happens, a lot of the material starts to fall into the nearby neutron star and some of this material obviously escapes and creates the supernova emissions as well. But because the nearby neutron star could have already been at its mass limit, it only required a little bit of mass before it also collapses into a black hole. And so as all of this mass starts to accumulate around the neutron star and obviously producing a lot of other energy as well, at some point the neutron star also reaches its limit. This is known as the TOV limit and mathematically at least it's not entirely clear where this limit lies. But it's believed to be no more than three masses of the sun. And so if a neutron star reaches this mass, it essentially explodes creating a black hole. Which is pretty much exactly what happened. But as it created the black hole, some of the magnetic lines that were present around the original neutron star were still there. And so even though this object has now become a black hole, there were still some of the magnetic lines present in the region, including the ergosphere of the newly spinning black hole. You can kind of see some of these lines present in this image right here. And because some of these lines were now inside the ergosphere, and because the ergosphere was also twisting the space-time itself, all of this extra spin now started to sort of twist and bend all of these magnetic lines, creating even more electrical energy than before. And even though it's really kind of mind-boggling and somewhat difficult to imagine what really happened, a lot of this extra energy that was now being extracted through the magnetic lines then started to be transferred into the gamma ray burst itself, which left the newly created black hole and started to move towards, well, really planet Earth, where we later detected it after four and a half billion years. But all of this extra energy and all of this extra power, according to this paper, was basically taken from the ergosphere, from the rotational energy of the black hole. Which, of course, if correct, means that we now have an observational proof that it's definitely possible to hypothetically steal energy from a spinning black hole, acquiring up to about 25% of extra energy than what you gave it originally. 
Or in other words, this is the direct observational proof of Penrose process being a real thing, a real phenomenon. A process that we might be able to discover again if we find another one of these binary-driven hypernova like the one we just saw. And in case you were wondering how long all of this took, well, it took about 1.99 seconds for the neutron star to turn into a black hole, and then for the next two seconds it was producing these powerful gamma ray bursts that technically are the most powerful gamma ray bursts we've ever seen. And so from the supernova until the end of the gamma ray burst, it took about 3.99 seconds, with a lot of the material then falling into the black hole or the neutron star and producing more x-rays that were visible afterwards as an afterglow. And the black hole itself was believed to be about 4.4 masses of the sun, spinning at about 40% of the speed of light, and also having a relatively powerful magnetic field as well. Something that they probably received from being the neutron star in the beginning, which is probably something that also happens to a lot of black holes out there. And so definitely a really interesting observation, and a very interesting potential confirmation of a really cool theory. But whether we can actually use this one day to somehow create energy out of nothing is of course another question. We still don't really know if we'll ever be able to detect and actually see a black hole somewhere near us, but chances are that it will probably take us a while before we find anything of that caliber. In our search for solutions to the mysteries of the universe, and in our search for various incredible objects out there, the scientists have developed a lot of different techniques. And some of these techniques are really mind-blowing. Hello, wonderful person. This is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about another really awesome discovery, and in this case of what the scientists refer to as the Goldilocks black hole. Black hole that's not too big, not too small. Just perfect. The black hole that we've been looking for for a very long time. The intermediate mass black hole. And in this case, they actually used a brilliant analysis and a brilliant technique to discover all of this. Now, first of all, let's start with the technique itself, which is based on this very beautiful phenomenon known as gravitational lensing, the effect that's predicted by the Einstein's theories and that we kind of see all over the universe. And this effect is produced when a somewhat bright object sends its light toward us, and this light goes through a region where there's a lot of mass, such as a galaxy, such as mysterious dark matter, or possibly some kind of a black hole. And this is what we usually see from Earth. And this usually works for a lot of different uh, objects, such as supernova, quasars, or a lot of other objects that are bright enough to emit their light for a very long distance. But there still has to be something massive right here in order to cause the light coming from these objects to bend and to form these beautiful images, such as this image from Hubble telescope known as the Einstein ring. And the thing is, we usually can figure out exactly what we're looking at by reconstructing the ring, but also calculate the precise mass of the object in front that caused the light to be bent and that caused the gravitational lensing to occur. And so in the last few decades, scientists have learned how to calculate all of this quite precisely. But most of the other studies usually use either bright quasars, because they're relatively easy to see, or in some cases supernova, and in some other cases some other bright objects, but not really what's known as gamma ray bursts. Gamma ray bursts are known as the most powerful, most energetic events in the universe. And we generally think that the form... Well, this video from NASA is about to show you. It's essentially when a tremendous amount of energy is released from a core of a massive star that runs out of its nuclear energy. And as it collapses under its own weight and is about to form a black hole, this black hole ends up driving this really, really large jet of particles out of this region. And all of this starts to move through various particles that have already been deposited there previously. This jet, as it collides with these particles, ends up producing a tremendous amount of energy. And this is usually in gamma ray radiation because of the powers involved here. And so basically, because the jet is so powerful and moves so fast and slams into all of this dust really, really fast, it ends up releasing these gamma ray bursts. And all of this happens really, really quickly too, although in some cases it does actually have a slightly longer effect depending on the original star and also depending on how much dust was in the region. And so it can be anywhere from just a few milliseconds up to a few hours in length. Also, generally, these events are believed to only form in some of the most powerful supernova, also known as superluminous supernova. So a typical supernova might not necessarily produce these. While others can also be hypothetically produced when two neutron stars collide, 
creating something very similar to what you just saw from a typical supernova explosion. So these events do have slightly different origins, but generally we know the overall structure of how these events progress and what to expect when we detect the first few milliseconds of this event. And so as an example, this image from NASA shows you the overall position in the night skies of pretty much all of the gamma ray bursts that were detected by the mission known as Batsy mission. And after about 8 years of observations, approximately 2500 of these bursts were detected across the night skies. And so there's definitely a lot of gamma ray burst data already available to us from as far back as a few decades ago. And because of this, you can actually use this data to study various other effects. And this is exactly what the scientists in this particular paper that you can find in the description below decided to do. They essentially reasoned that somewhere in this gamma ray burst data, they can hypothetically discover one of these gamma ray bursts that might have been also gravitationally lensed by something really massive as it passed through some sort of a region as it moved closer and closer to Earth. And specifically, they were reasoning that they can discover this by looking at the gravitational lensing echo. And the way this echo forms is explained in this video from Leiden Institute of Physics. Notice how when the actual position of the object is not really in the middle, one of the lines is going to be slightly longer than the other. And that means that the light from this bright object in the back is going to arrive at different times. Which means that there's going to be a kind of an echo in the data. As if the same gamma ray burst happened twice. And if we actually find this in some of the data, it means that it must have been gravitational lens by an object, a massive object, that was slightly misaligned. And to analyze all of this, the scientist behind the study developed his own library for Python, which he refers to as PyGRB, Python Gamma Ray Burst, I guess, analysis tool. And this particular analysis tool is specifically developed to be able to find these echoes and a lot of other unusual data from various gamma rays that have been detected over the past few decades. And as you can probably imagine, they did discover one such burst that did have an unusual echo in it. An echo that was caused by something really massive, approximately 55,000 masses of the sun. And just to give you a comparison with some of the other black holes, here's what a typical smaller black hole looks like. This is the type that we usually detect when black holes collide, or some of the other black holes we detected in our own galaxy. Just to give you a comparison, this right here is Phobos, one of the moons of Mars. So this is an object that's maybe about 30 kilometers across our soul. But the size here doesn't really matter much because it's all about the mass. And the mass here is roughly around 10 masses of the sun. Then a lot of other black holes we've discovered are supermassive black holes. The one in the middle of our own galaxy, Sagittarius A star, roughly about 4.3 million masses of the sun and several times larger than our own sun in terms of size. But unfortunately, in between these two sizes, there haven't really been too many discoveries. These so-called intermediate mass black holes have been a mystery. And so, so far we've only discovered a couple of other intermediate mass black holes, with one not so long ago, that in terms of mass was about 300 masses of the sun. But we've never found a black hole that was thousands of masses of the sun. We've never found this Goldilocks black hole, something that fits right between these two. Something that would explain how these massive black holes form, because naturally if we find an intermediate mass black hole, we can then explain how more massive black holes form. But without seeing these intermediate mass black holes, it's extremely difficult to explain how any of this works. But by discovering this unusual gravitational lensing effect coming from a gamma ray burst known as GRB 950830 that was originally discovered back in 1995, the scientists were pretty certain that whatever it was, it was first of all really massive, 55,000 masses of the sun, but second of all was very compact. And compact enough to be, very likely, a black hole. And in this graph itself, you can even see the original detection and the echo that followed. And although hypothetically this could maybe also be some sort of a massive globular cluster with just a lot of mass concentrated in the center, the data does suggest that the object is just a little bit too compact, a little bit too dense to be that. It is more likely to be a very massive, almost point-like object, which in this case would only suggest a black hole and more specifically, an intermediate mass black hole. Something that the scientists have always tried to find and something that so far we kind of failed to find. Or at least intermediate mass black holes with masses in thousands of masses of the sun. All of the previous detections never had a mass over 300 masses of the sun. 
And at the moment, this seems to be the first ever statistical confirmation of the existence of these types of black holes and the first confirmation of a gravitationally lensed gamma ray burst. Something that scientists suspected they're going to find at some point, but something that has so far not been discovered until now. And by the way, in case you were wondering how they actually know how compact this object was, and if you're like me and you're sometimes too lazy to just go through the data yourself, it's really due to this, the actual delay. The delay here is in milliseconds, and this can only be done by an object that's extremely, extremely compact. If the object was much more widespread, the echo would arrive much later. But because the echo arrived so quickly after the initial detection, that's why it was first of all missed originally, mostly because back then we just didn't have the technology to analyze all of this in such a detail. But second of all, it just means that the object was really, really small in size. Not in mass though, but in size. With the total size of this object roughly being equivalent to maybe about twice the size of planet Jupiter. So it is very compact and we don't really know of any other objects that can be so small and have such a huge mass. So for now at least, this right here is the best explanation. But by detecting this object, we now have a pretty good idea and a pretty good explanation for how larger black holes could be created as well. Assuming of course all of this is confirmed and maybe some of the other IMBH or intermediate mass black holes are discovered somewhere out there, all of this would then provide a really good explanation for how these black holes can easily grow over time to masses of millions and even billions masses of the sun. Obviously if a lot of these black holes started colliding with one another for millions and billions of years, some of these black holes might actually end up really really large. And so by using the technique developed in the study, a lot of other scientists might end up discovering even more of these massive compact objects and, for all we know, possibly even discover some other mysteries we can't even imagine right now. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about a pretty exciting but somewhat hypothetical topic in regards to Dyson spheres. And specifically, we're going to be discussing this relatively recent paper that tries to identify and tries to analyze the potential existence of Dyson spheres around supermassive black holes. Could some sort of advanced civilization, such as what we would call Type 2 or Type 3 Kardashev civilization, potentially have an ability to create a massive structure around a black hole in order to absorb more energy for its own use? And more importantly, the paper tries to answer the question, could they physically exist? Or would the black hole completely destroy these structures? And also, if they do exist, such as around the central massive black hole in the middle of the Milky Way galaxy, would there be any way for us to detect them using modern technology? And short spoiler, the answer to all of these questions seems to be more or less yes. So let's start with the basics. Back in the 60s, the brilliant Freeman Dyson that you see right here published a few scientific articles describing a very hypothetical scenario of how a really advanced civilization could collect energy from their star. Something that we today refer to as the Dyson Sphere, or depending on the structure, sometimes it's also known as the Dyson Swarm, Dyson Bubble, or Dyson Ring, with the structures themselves serving as a kind of a direct way of collecting energy of the star itself and thus providing a tremendous amount of energy for some sort of an advanced civilization that might require this energy. Now there are quite a lot of other videos covering this in a lot more detail, but the idea itself is kind of sound. And it's so sound as a matter of fact that one of the main targets of SETI, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, is actually trying to discover some of these unusual structures somewhere out there around a distant star, with several unusual blinking stars such as the famous Tabby star being potential targets but a lot of these suggestions are more or less biased toward human understanding of technology. We kind of assume that things are going to get bigger, we're going to require more energy, and as a result we're going to have to build bigger and bigger structures, potentially around planets and then around stars. Now in the past I've previously discussed some of the other propositions in regards to this, but for now let's just stick with this. Let's say that this is actually what happens to most advanced civilizations. Well, in that case, naturally, after a typical star, the civilization will probably start looking at some other energy sources. And at the moment, we don't really know of any other source more powerful than a black hole, specifically a supermassive black hole. And so once again, hypothetically speaking, a type 2 or even type 3 Kardashev civilization, a civilization that's able to produce really grandiose structures, potentially covering the entire planet or even an entire star, 
would then most likely seek the center of the galaxy in order to collect the energy from the black hole itself. But the question here is, would such a structure be effective at capturing all of this energy? And if so, what type of energy would it end up capturing the most? And more importantly, what sort of emissions would it actually produce in order for us to detect it from planet Earth? Would it be possible for us to see these structures using modern technology? And so the scientists from a university in Taiwan decided to investigate all of this and produce a pretty interesting paper you can find in the description below. And specifically, they decided to focus on six different sources of energy. For example, one of the sources is the cosmic background radiation. And even though here on Earth CMB doesn't really provide that much energy around a black hole because of the ridiculously powerful blue shifting effects from the gravitational pull of the black hole, some of the cosmic microwave background ends up being in really high frequencies of light. We've actually discussed this in some of the previous videos somewhere right there. The other potential source of energy is the Hawking radiation, the emissions from the black hole itself. But the most powerful types of radiation is probably going to be coming from the accretion disk itself, because this is literally a bunch of star-like material orbiting around the black hole, and it produces a tremendous amount of radiation. Another type of energy that could potentially be captured is something known as the Bondi accretion, which is essentially a spherical accretion disk that's formed by a traveling massive object through a lot of different interstellar gas. Another extremely powerful event is what's known as the black hole corona. This is so powerful that it's usually visible from extremely far away distances and normally produces tremendous amount of energy as well. And lastly, the sixth source of energy could also be the relativistic jets. These jets are also very powerful and could hypothetically be used to capture the magnetic energy from the black hole itself. And so a lot of these different features around black holes could be used in different ways to capture this energy. But to make this more mathematic, the scientists in this paper decided to focus on three different models. The models of black holes that are similar to the one in the Milky Way, the one that's slightly larger at 5 million masses of the Sun, and the one that's even bigger at 20 million masses of the Sun. Determining in the end that even though it will be pretty impossible to produce an actual sphere-like object, building a sphere of satellites, so basically some sort of a Dyson bubble, would be a pretty effective way to capture and harvest a lot of this black hole energy, with the largest amount of energy coming from the accretion disk itself. Here, the amount of energy that can be gathered from a black hole similar to the one in the middle of our own galaxy is around 100,000 times more than can be captured from our own sun. But if the civilization is also able to capture the astrophysical jets, the energy amount is going to increase up to about five times. In other words, the astrophysical jets and the accretion disk represent the largest amount of energy that can be harvested from a typical supermassive black hole. So definitely possible and definitely doable. But could we actually see them and detect them? So back in the days, back in the 60s, Freeman Dyson proposed that because of the heating up of the object, because of the actual process of the energy exchange, it would be possible to see these structures in the infrared. Essentially, the structure would most likely produce a tremendous amount of infrared light, which would allow the scientists to potentially discover these objects in really, really far away places in the universe. And upon thorough examination, it should be possible to tell if we're looking at a, for example, brown dwarf, or if we're looking at a star with an actual Dyson sphere around it. In other words, Dyson himself proposed that it's possible to detect these objects in the infrared. But in this particular case, as you start building larger and larger structures around other objects, such as really massive stars, or in this case black holes, the emitted wavelengths change dramatically as well. As a matter of fact, if such a structure exists somewhere out there, it would be detectable in multiple wavelengths. Actually, even Dyson himself proposed that a hotter Dyson sphere around a much hotter star would most likely emit ultraviolet light, not just infrared light. So what about a Dyson sphere built around the Sagittarius A star, a black hole in the middle of our own galaxy? Well, in this case, the scientists are pretty certain it would emit a lot of ultraviolet light, a lot of near-infrared light, but also quite a lot of optical light, meaning that it would be a multi-wavelength detection and it should be detectable and also visible to modern telescopes. With one specific survey, this one right here known as GALAX, or Galaxy Evolution Explorer potentially already having enough data collected in order to establish if such a structure actually exists around Sagittarius A star. 
But the question is, of course, how can you tell if what we're detecting is a natural radiation from the black hole or if it's emissions from some sort of a Dyson sphere? And that right there is probably why we're not going to be able to answer this for a very long time. It would be almost impossible to tell apart the natural radiation from the radiation from some sort of a structure. But in this case, there's at least one proposition from the scientists in this paper. Hypothetically, if there is some sort of a Dyson sphere around the black hole, it's going to also interfere with some of the emissions from the black hole. For example, maybe due to the gravitational effects from the Dyson swarm itself, or from minute changes and minute interactions between the swarm and the black hole emissions. And if one day we actually detect some unusual interactions and some unusual perturbations in the black hole emissions, that could be a sign that there is something there. At the moment, it's just not really possible to do any of this. And really mostly because the black holes themselves are already so chaotic and produce so many different emissions that it sometimes are kind of difficult to explain. And so maybe in some future studies, someone is going to come up with some way to potentially detect these structures. At the moment, it's very theoretical, and though it does make sense, it's still extremely, extremely hypothetical. Nevertheless, it does imply that maybe somewhere out there, there could be a super advanced civilization using black holes as a source of energy. And according to the scientists in this paper, the amount of energy collected from a supermassive black hole would automatically make this a type 3 Kardashev civilization, simply based on the amount of energy collected from the black hole. And so overall, a pretty interesting paper and a pretty interesting proposition. But in the paper, they obviously mention a lot of other things, like for example, how far away from the black hole would you have to build the Dyson sphere itself in order for it not to fall apart or to burn into a crisp? And for a supermassive black hole in the middle of the Milky Way galaxy, it would have to be relatively far away, approximately 150 astronomical units away from the center or about 22 billion kilometers. But even at these distances, it would be able to capture quite a lot of energy. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about new observations from the very famous Event Horizon Telescope of the beautiful Centaurus A galaxy that doesn't actually look that impressive here because this is what you would see with optical light. But if you were to combine the observations from the visible light, from the X-ray light, from the infrared, and from the radio light, you would suddenly be faced with one of the most beautiful objects in the night skies, also one of the brightest as well, the gorgeous galaxy known as Centaurus A. And the most recent study involving the EHT, Event Horizon Telescope, the telescope famous for taking this beautiful picture of M87 black hole, decided to investigate Centaurus A galaxy and specifically the center of the galaxy by using the extreme magnification powers of this telescope collaboration. But first, let's do a little bit of history. What exactly is Centaurus A? This galaxy is actually one of our neighbors, and this is sort of what it looks like if you were to somehow use a normal telescope to try to take a look at it. It doesn't look like much. And because of this, after its original discovery in the mid-1800s, up until 1950, it was actually completely ignored by almost everyone. It did not look like much or like anything important. But once the scientists figured out how to take a look at various galaxies in radio waves and also by using some other frequencies, this galaxy transformed majestically. It literally became one of the most important objects in the night skies simply because of the amount of radiation it was producing, especially through its very powerful astrophysical jets. By 1954, scientists realized that it's very likely that a lot of this magnificence is actually produced because of the merger of two galaxies approximately 100 million years ago. And for the first 90 million years, there was really nothing happening, just a lot of mixture and a lot of activity. But suddenly, about 10 million years ago, that's when the galaxy released these powerful and extremely beautiful astrophysical jets that are now visible from really far away. Now, interestingly, not so long ago, I've talked about this beautiful radio map created by the Australian Telescope uh, Foundation known as CSIRO. If you actually click on the link in the description below, you'll find this map as well. And here, it literally shows us what the entire night skies, at least in Australia, would look like in radio waves. Something that our eyes are not able to see, obviously. But if you were to look around here, you'll discover some areas of night skies that are a little bit brighter than others. For example, this is obviously the Milky Way, which of course shows us the central region of our galaxy where there are a lot of different radio sources. But there are some other patches here that don't actually make sense. And one such patch is right here. This is only visible in radio waves. 
And this, as you can imagine, is the Centaurus A galaxy that we're talking about today, which is pretty much the brightest source of radio waves close to planet Earth. And because of this, Centaurus A is technically a radio galaxy, and it's also an active galactic nucleus galaxy. The objects that usually produce something like this. So here's another example from another galaxy known as Hercules A. And notice how these unusual astrophysical jets are extremely long. They're so long, as a matter of fact, that they form some of the biggest structures in the universe, with some being millions of light years across, way larger than even some of the largest galaxies. And it just so happens that one such galaxy is right next door. Now, because it only started emitting these jets about 10 million years ago, it still has ways to go before it acquires these really, really long jets. But even now, they're actually long and powerful enough to be visible if you do have some sort of a way of looking at this in radio waves. Now, in case you were ever wondering how these particular radio jets are produced and what exactly happens inside of them to produce so much radio energy, well, it's what we refer to as synchrotron radiation. And the way this works is, if you were to take any charged particle, such as, for example, an electron, and if you were to essentially make it somehow spin around something, or even further go into some sort of vortex-like formation, so kind of like what happens inside these astrophysical jets, for example, because the electrons are forced to go in a spin or in a circle, they will start emitting what's known as the synchrotron light, or synchrotron radiation that's normally in radio waves. And when there are a lot of electrons, or a lot of charged particles, and also a lot of spin involved, that's when you get a lot of radio emissions, which is basically exactly what we're seeing right here. This is how these astrophysical jets that emit radio waves are formed. But even today, the scientists are still not entirely sure what exactly produces these astrophysical jets, and what sort of effects are responsible for causing such tremendous speeds of these particles. But the scientists are certain that it has something to do with the black hole in the middle. For Centaurus A, the black hole is actually really interesting. It's way, way more massive than the one in the middle of our own galaxy, but way less massive than the one in M87. It's actually right in between. It's about 55 million masses of the Sun. And the recent analysis from the Event Horizon Telescope was able to really zoom in on this area, identifying the exact location of the black hole, while also being able to see extreme details of the jets that have never been seen before. Here's actually what the previous image looked like from a few years ago. But here's that same area zoomed in even more and analyzed by the team from the Event Horizon Telescope. This is actually about 37 times more zoomed in and literally shows us what happens extremely close to a typical massive black hole when the jets are just created by the effects from the central black hole, with the black hole itself being located somewhere inside of this white circle. And in terms of the distances involved here, well, this right here is the distance from the Sun to the Voyager probes, so this is pretty far away. As a matter of fact, our solar system would only represent a tiny, tiny, tiny point in the middle of this. But considering the distances involved between the galaxy and what we're actually looking at here, this is a pretty tremendous achievement. One of the reasons it was actually very difficult to see any of this in detail before is because Centaurus A is more or less in the southern part of our planet. It has a declination of about 43 degrees to the south. And so it's very difficult for most of the telescopes to see this. But the team in the EHT managed to figure this out and thus managed to analyze this galaxy in detail that was previously impossible to achieve. But unlike the observations from the M87 black hole, the main purpose for this particular study is to really try to figure out what starts these jets. As I mentioned, it's not clear what produces them and why they are the way they are. So for example, one of the major confirmations from this study, which is also more or less visible in this image right here, seems to indicate that the jets are brighter at the edges. Notice how they form this unusual formation, almost resembling a letter V. And since this jet brightening is definitely an important feature of other jets as well, it means that they're produced in a very certain way, but the scientists at the moment are not clear on how it's done just yet. Most likely it has something to do with the very powerful magnetic fields that are formed by the very powerful accretion disks around these black holes. But the exact details of what happens here and how the jets are produced are still a little bit murky. But these observations from EHT do suggest that any explanation has to take this edge brightening into account. It seems to be an important feature of a lot of different jets, including the ones around M87 black hole. But the amount of this edge brightening as visible in this picture 
is actually quite surprising, so it does mean that it's some sort of a very important feature that was previously not entirely understood. And so this is the mystery that the EHT team is hoping to solve in the next few years from now. At the same time, one of the more important discoveries here was the fact that the jet itself seems to resemble the jet from the M87 black hole in terms of the structure and in terms of the way that it propagates through space. We've actually discussed these findings in one of the previous videos that should be somewhere right there, and the main discovery here is that the jets, for the most part, seem to resemble one another, except for, of course, the actual scale. One is way larger than the other. With the other important identification and finding being the fact that they now know exactly where the black hole is located. They haven't actually seen it just yet, mostly because of the frequency used in this study, but the scientists in the paper believe that if they change the observational frequency from 228 GHz used here to several terahertz, they could definitely observe what happens around the black hole in this galaxy as well. Which is very likely what they're going to be trying to do next. They're going to try to observe this in higher frequencies in order to get even more resolution and to then hopefully see the black hole in this galaxy as well. Although in this case, it would really help the scientists to get a few more telescopes in their telescope network with some sort of a space telescope being the best choice. But unfortunately, the only space radio telescope Spectre R, the Russian-German collaboration that observed the universe in various frequencies of light, ceased operation a couple of years ago. Now, there might be a way to maybe re-enable it somehow, but for now, it's not really planned. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about some new discoveries in regards to what happens around black holes. And not just any black holes, supermassive black holes. And in this particular case, one of the recent studies decided to investigate and to try to model the formation of these really, really humongous waves that seem to be created by very unusual effects coming from the center of the black hole. The waves that the scientists refer to as tsunami waves. With this beautiful illustration by Nima Apkenar, sort of showing us how all of this might look like. And depending on the size of the actual black hole, these tsunami waves could be up to about 10 light years in size. And so let's talk a little bit more about this study and the discovery, starting with the idea of tsunamis here on Earth. So we know that on Earth, for a tsunami to form, usually some sort of an underwater event has to happen, such as usually an earthquake or a sudden displacement of matter that then creates a displacement of water. And here, as a tsunami wave approaches the shore, it first decreases in speed, but then increases in size. And eventually, it ends up delivering a huge amount of water and can last for anywhere from a few hours to possibly even a few days. So this is tsunamis in a nutshell. But by using a computer modeling simulation and by trying to analyze what happens around black holes, the scientists behind this paper right here were able to work out that a very similar event could actually happen around black holes, but instead of water in this case, it would be gas. A lot of gas. Tremendous amounts of gas. Although in this case, it's also important to kind of try to figure out how all this looks like in terms of structure. So we're still sort of learning about black holes and we're still trying to understand what sort of happens in their vicinity. For small black holes, it's usually a little bit different than for massive black holes, and so it's obviously not clear if this happens around all of the black holes. But for a supermassive black hole, such as the one in the center of the Milky Way, or for any massive black hole over 1 million masses of the Sun, they will usually start forming relatively similar structures. If simplified, it might look something like this. There's going to be an accretion disk, or more like an accretion torus around it. It's also going to produce the corona visible right here, and it's also going to have a lot of wind outflow. So this is sort of the simple version of what's known as the active galactic nucleus. But the picture does get a little bit more complex as you move away from the center of the black hole and as you start seeing what else is going on in the vicinity of the accretion disk and around the accretion disk. For example, first of all, around the disk there is a huge torus of a lot of different cold gas that doesn't actually fall into the black hole and sort of orbits around this region without really being affected by the black hole itself. And because this gas can be really, really thick, it's usually almost impossible for the scientists to actually see the black hole itself or to try to peer through the thickness of the disk to see the insides. Now, at the same time, right above the accretion disk, there's actually a tremendous amount of really, really hot plasma. Very similar stuff to what we find inside our sun. And a lot of this super hot plasma orbits far enough from the black hole that it's not going to fall into the black hole, but it also produces a lot of different X-ray radiation. 
In the past, these X-ray emissions have even been used to try to map the region of a black hole by seeing various reflections from the accretion disk itself. And these regions are so incredibly bright in the X-rays that they're visible from really, really far away in the universe. But at the same time, these emissions are sort of responsible for what's known as the outflow. Sort of like the solar wind, but in this case, it's a black hole wind that's moving extremely fast. And so it's sort of believed that it creates something like this. There's a lot of dust coming out of from this side. It also creates a kind of a torus that orbits as far away as 100 light years away from the black hole itself. And it also creates a really large region of cold dust, some of which has also been proposed to be a region where new stars and possibly even new planets can form. In other words, it's a really, really intriguing and super interesting region that a lot of scientists would love to see one day. But because of this really powerful outflow from the center, the power coming from these X-rays and from the gas outflow can actually create some really interesting effects in the region around the black hole. And so here the scientists were able to model what probably happens around a typical massive black hole if it does have a really thick region of this cold dust around it. So first of all, it's already been established that there are probably a lot of different types of clouds and a lot of different types of dust in the region around a massive active black hole, including what's known as the clumpy outflow that the scientists believe is created by the sudden X-ray emissions from the accretion disk itself of the massive black hole. And it's also believed that a lot of these clouds, a lot of this gas, is extremely hot, possibly 50,000 degrees Celsius or about 10 times as hot as our own sun. But slightly farther away, at a distance of maybe about 10 to 100 light years away from the black hole, in the region of this coal dust right here, this is actually where we start finding a lot of different turbulence and a lot of different activity very similar to what you expect from here on planet Earth. So first of all, a lot of different kinds of waves start to form. For example, the so-called Karman Vortex Street. The unusual waves you can see simulated right here formed in various gases and in various liquids. Although in this case, the size of these vortices would be huge. Each of them would be approximately one light year across. Moreover, as this clumpy outflow starts hitting some of this cold gas located around the black hole, the shear pressure from the interaction sort of has a very similar effect to what you see right here. It essentially is responsible for creating some sort of a tsunami gas wave. And so the interaction between these really, really hot emissions and the cold gas that's already there ends up producing tsunami waves that could be up to 10 light years in size or maybe even more if the black hole is bigger and if there's more gas around it. But because of the distances involved here, all of this of course takes a really, really long time. Even at the fastest possible speed of movement of about 20% the speed of light, it would take hundreds of years for all of this interaction to start producing these waves and then probably thousands of years for this gas to form the tsunami. So this right here represents an extremely slow process and something that we will probably never be able to see in actual real time. We can maybe only see the waves after they've already been created or possibly detect the interaction between the super fast moving hot gas and the relatively slow moving cold gas. And the scientists in this paper believe that both the tsunami waves and the Karman vortex street structures start being formed across this entire region hundreds of light years away from the central black hole. Which of course means that if we were to somehow be able to see what a typical supermassive black hole looks like from let's just say a thousand light years away from us, at the moment this image right here might actually show us what it really looks like, at least in terms of the artistic illustration. Although chances are it's also a lot more bright, it's also a lot more active in a lot of different other ways, and there are probably a lot of other structures we haven't really considered yet. But what's interesting about this study is that it's able to provide the explanation for the creation of these waves, while at the same time suggesting that the magnetic fields do not play as much of a role in this case in propelling the gas across the black hole region and in creating a lot of the outflow from the black hole itself. We do know that the magnetic fields here are pretty strong, but in this case they were able to explain this by actually ignoring the magnetic fields, which of course means that depending on the strength of the magnetic field, there could be a lot of other effects and a lot of other formations that have not been considered in this paper or in some other papers before that. But more importantly, this is still just a hypothesis and still just a proposition. None of this of course has been physically observed, but the scientists believe that by using some of the new telescopes, including some of the more advanced X-ray telescopes that are going to be operational in the next few years, with a mission known as XRISM, 
being of particular interest in this case, we might actually have enough resolution to be able to see what exactly happens around these regions and how exactly the X-rays from a typical supermassive black hole end up influencing the gas on the outskirts. Or in other words, even though the idea behind black hole tsunamis sounds absolutely incredible, it still could be just an idea, just a hypothesis that could be proven wrong. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about some really exciting discoveries coming from a typical global cluster. Actually, we're talking about a very specific global cluster, but just global clusters in general. And the discovery is something that the scientists really didn't expect to find. First though, what are global clusters? Now, if you've done any kind of astronomy in your lifetime, you probably know that there are certain objects in the night skies that are, are extremely bright. And you can kind of see some of them right here in this simulation. Look at several of these objects that sort of resemble stars. However, none of these are stars. If I were to jump to one of them, you would quickly discover that what this represents is actually a collection of stars. Now, okay, this is kind of bright. Let's dim it a little bit. So this right here is what we refer to as a globular cluster, sometimes also known as just globular. Now, these clusters are pretty much everywhere, and they also have a lot of really interesting relationships and a lot of different correlations to a galaxy where we usually find them. We also use them for a lot of different discoveries, like for example, discovering the total mass of a galaxy, discovering the speed of different stars in a galaxy, or even looking for different signs of dark matter somewhere out there in the universe. They're also used for calculating distances to objects. Basically, they're very, very useful. But most importantly, they also seem to correlate to the history of the galaxy itself. More globular clusters usually means more collisions that happen in that particular galaxy. In the Milky Way galaxy, we know that there are probably around 150-ish globular clusters. Actually, some of the recent papers suggested that it was closer to 158, with maybe about 10 or so still missing. And that's how many we have here. If we were to look at the nearest larger galaxy, that of course being the Andromeda galaxy you see right there, it has roughly around 500 different globular clusters. And then if we look at the famous M87 galaxy with the famous picture of the black hole that was taken a few years ago, here we can find up to about 13,000 global clusters. Which of course makes sense because these galaxies are way more massive and also possess a lot more stars and a lot more matter. But interestingly, generally global clusters are also extremely old. They're much older than typical stars, they're also much older than so-called open clusters and they can generally tell us more about the history of the galaxy and even tell us about the age of the galaxy. We know, for example, that some of the older galaxies that existed in the Milky Way are basically the representatives of the earliest formation of stars in our galaxy. We're still not entirely sure how their formation differs from the other stars in the galaxy, but we know that they do correlate with a lot of other parts of the galaxy. For example, there are definite correlations between global clusters and the central bulge of the galaxy. There are also correlations of total mass of the galaxy and the number of global clusters. And the average age of global clusters usually represents the average age of the galaxy itself. And although to some extent they resemble certain dwarf elliptical galaxies and might even have several features that are very similar, their overall origin and evolution seems to be entirely different and possibly is one of the last mysteries that we have in terms of the formation of different objects in the universe. We basically have no idea how they really form. And though some of them might have actually been cores of different galaxies in the past, some of them have also been developed completely by themselves independently from everything else in the galaxy. And what all of this means is that these are individual objects, these are individual formations, and do actually form independently of things in the galaxy, which also means that they can be created in a completely remote location somewhere. But the question has always been, so what's inside of them though? We know that there are a lot of pulsars, for example. We know there are a lot of neutron stars. We also know there are a lot of stars and obviously maybe also a lot of planets. As you can probably imagine, the average density of stars here is extremely high. If you were to stand on the surface of a planet here and look into the night skies, you would probably see something like this. This is of course simulated, but this is the average density of stars in a typical global cluster. Now, this means that it's very bright, but it also means that there's a lot of radiation coming from everywhere. There are possibly also a lot more supernova, a lot more emissions from obviously black holes and neutron stars, and, well, if life exists here, it's probably extremely resilient or is hiding somewhere. 
But remember, the stars here are also much closer, so traveling between these stars is also a lot easier. Anyway, we kind of get enough track here. The important thing is that global clusters are fascinating. And one of the recent studies that you can find in the description below decided to investigate the second closest global cluster to planet Earth. The cluster known as NGC 6397 located around 7800 light years away from planet Earth. And although it doesn't seem like it, there are actually 400,000 stars here. And because of its distance and also because of the amount of stars here, if you were to look at this in a night skies in a relatively dark place, you can actually easily see this without any telescope. And it's also one of the few global clusters in the Milky Way that has gone through something known as a core collapse. Which is basically an event when all of the stars on the outskirts slowly move closer and closer to the center and eventually bundle up, creating a much thicker and a much more dense environment with all of the stars being really really close together. Now, why this happens, we're not really sure, and also what's exactly in the middle or in the center is also very unclear, but that's exactly what the scientists wanted to find out in this paper. Because the assumption was based on the observations from some of the other clusters. The assumption was that deep in the center of all of these core collapse clusters, there's going to be a relatively large intermediate sized black hole. You might already know what this is, but essentially it's a black hole that's anywhere from a few hundred to a few thousand masses of the sun. It's not as massive as a black hole in the middle of a typical galaxy, but it's massive enough to cause the core collapse and to also possibly have certain other effects on these stars. And so their goal was to see if there's actually some sort of a relatively massive, but not really super massive, black hole in the middle that could explain a lot of these observations and could maybe provide some other detail. And by the way, interestingly, this particular global cluster is essentially as old as our galaxy. It's about 13.4 billion years old, which also means that all of the stars here are also extremely old. And the total radius of this global cluster containing 400,000 stars is roughly around 34 light years, which also suggests that there are roughly around 1,000 more stars or even more than 1,000 stars in the same volume as you would find around us here in the solar system. Which once again means that the night skies here would be quite spectacular. And to get as much detail about the stars as possible, the scientists here as always use the beautiful Gaia telescope that in the last few years allowed us to create an extremely accurate map of nearby billions and billions of stars with exact motion, exact parameters and properties, and allowed the scientists to make a lot of really interesting discoveries already. And so by using the data from the Gaia telescope, the scientists analyzed the motions of the stars inside this particular global cluster. And, as always, their discovery was a little bit unexpected. They did not discover what they expected to find in regards to the intermediate black hole. The motion of stars here was exhibiting almost like a Brownian motion. It was sort of random in all directions. Whereas what they expected to find was something similar to this. A lot of stars in different kinds of orbits orbiting a somewhat massive central point, which would be the intermediate mass black hole. Yet nevertheless, there was a central mass in the middle of the cluster. There was a central point that was more massive than other points. But unlike their prediction, the mass was not a point. It was a very large collection across a larger volume. Extended to a few percent of the volume from the center of the cluster. And that to scientists implied only one thing. It implied a really large number of remnants of black holes, possibly neutron stars, possibly white dwarfs, but most importantly, a lot of smaller black holes. Black holes everywhere. Now currently the scientists are not sure how many and what the total mass is, but it seems that there are definitely a lot of them. And all of this is kind of pointing at the history of this particular cluster. As a lot of stars in this cluster age with time over billions and billions of years, most of them turn into remnants. They became white dwarfs, they became neutron stars, they became black holes. A lot of this stuff slowly circulated around and moved closer and closer and closer to the center. Eventually, the center became saturated with all of these remnants. Now, right now, um, we don't really know what exactly is the main remnant there, but chances for those remnants to be black holes is really, really high. And here we're talking about a lot of black holes, possibly hundreds, maybe even thousands. The majority of the mass in the center is definitely these invisible black holes that are slowly circulating around one another. And this is actually a really important discovery because it could solve another major mystery we've had for the past five or six years. The mystery of gravitational waves. In the past few years, the scientists have been discovering a lot of gravitational waves. 
way, way more than anyone ever theorized was possible. At some point, they were detected almost once a week. And this is sort of really difficult to explain. Some scientists suggested that all of this could be explained if these black holes were colliding very close to a central black hole in a typical galaxy where we do expect some black holes to exist. But this particular study actually might give a better explanation. The explanation that has been theorized by many different scientists. A lot of these miniature smaller black holes are colliding inside different global clusters. These typical global clusters, if they contain hundreds and thousands of smaller black holes, will have a very, very high chance to have a collision with frequencies that we're detecting here on planet Earth. In other words, a typical global cluster with hundreds and thousands of black holes in the middle will very likely experience way, way more collisions than any other region in a typical galaxy, mostly because these black holes are already very close to each other, they're also relatively similar mass and have relatively similar other properties, and they're also orbiting around one another in somewhat hectic conditions. Something that might resemble this, although with much bigger numbers and also with a lot more, well, technically randomness. And here the collisions would definitely happen quite frequently. As a matter of fact, ever since I created the simulation, there were already at least three different collisions, and this is only after a few hours of running the simulation, which means that if you were to wait long enough, eventually all of them would probably collide with one another. But I guess the next question here is, are all global clusters going to have similar conditions in them? Do they all contain these hundreds and thousands of different remnants in the middle, or are they all different? Which means that maybe global clusters fall under different types. Maybe some of them do have intermediate mass black holes, and some of them only have smaller black holes. This is of course not something we can know now, but it's also something that the scientists are now going to try to answer in future studies. Nevertheless, all of these discoveries in regards to global clusters are definitely helping us answer a lot of different questions we've had about the universe in other parts. But studies like this definitely show us that it's really important to study global clusters because we're going to possibly answer a lot of mysteries of the universe by looking inside of these unusual objects. And that of course includes questions like extraterrestrial intelligence. You might already know that the famous Arecibo message that was sent back in 1974 was sent toward a global cluster known as M13, because back then scientists were pretty convinced that if we were to find any extraterrestrial intelligence, the highest chance would be in a global cluster such as this one. And that particular sentiment hasn't actually changed much. The chance for finding something exciting inside global clusters is still really, really high. But unfortunately for us, the closest one to us is still pretty far away several thousand light years away from us. So visiting one is sort of right now only in the realm of science fiction. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about a new fascinating study in regards to discoveries about black holes. Specifically discoveries about the Hawking radiation coming from black holes and what we generally understand about what might happen inside a black hole we're going to discuss the so-called inner horizon. But before we start all of this, well, how do we even study all of this? How can we possibly know anything about black holes if the closest one we know of is like thousands of light years away from us, and if it's basically impossible to create an actual physical black hole here on planet Earth? Well, all of the recent experiments in the last few decades have actually been conducted using the so-called black hole analogs, or black holes in a tube if you want to call them that, because we basically found a way to recreate black hole conditions using other methods, for example, liquids, gases, and even the light itself. Now, the most interesting experiments have mostly been conducted with liquids. For example, not so long ago, the scientists from University of Nottingham used a water tank and a vortex produced in the water tank to study what happens to black holes when different types of waves around the black holes start pushing on the actual liquid itself. The effect that is often referred to in physics as back reaction. And what they realized is that even the vortex waves were actually causing the water to be pushed down as it approached closer and closer to the center, to the simulated black hole. And this caused the water level to drop, essentially showing us that these effects were changing the mass of the black hole itself. So the waves around the black hole, the gravitational waves and also the waves of all of this matter falling into the black hole do affect the black hole quite dramatically. Another interesting way of creating black hole analogs is by using quantum effects and specifically what's known as Bose-Einstein condensate. 
which is a type of a quantum gas that changes the speed of light inside of it. And so by using the property of this gas where it actually can flow pretty quickly and by using the speed of light inside of this gas, it's possible to create very interesting optical analogs to black holes by using the gas and by essentially observing the effects when the light cannot escape the gas because the gas flows much faster. But this particular example is kind of complex and is also not particularly used simply because there is a much better method of doing this. And that's with sound waves. As of today, sonic black holes or sound black holes are actually the most accurate and also some of the easiest analogs we can create here on planet Earth. And as of the last decade or so, there have been a lot of experiments trying to investigate what actually happens inside of these objects. And one of the main reasons they are actually so popular is, well, you can actually learn about this in one of the papers in the description, but in a nutshell, they represent an extremely accurate representation of an actual astrophysical black hole. The sound waves produced in these sonic black holes, with either fluid or the gas flowing here, where the sound wave itself is sort of equivalent to a light particle very close to the black hole, allow us to investigate a lot of different effects, including things like Hawking radiation, including things like the event horizon or the inner horizon, and even find out what might actually happen inside of the black hole if you were to cross the event horizon. And that's actually pretty much what the scientists in the recent paper discovered. And if you've ever wondered what happens if you cross the event horizon, and if it's the end of the story for you, in this video you might actually discover that the answer is no, something else might happen. Something that might actually allow you to live inside the black hole for a pretty long time. But obviously they're not the same. So here in the black hole we have the event horizon where no light can escape. But in the sonic black holes we're really mostly talking about the sound wave not being able to escape the very fast flow of the atoms. So in that sense it is really different. At the same time, the main difference between a sonic black hole and a typical astrophysical black hole is really the shape. This one here is three-dimensional, or even four-dimensional if you want to go that far. But pretty much all of the analog black holes, at least using sound waves, have been more or less two-dimensional or, well, even one-dimensional because they sometimes represent a single line. Which makes them much easier to study, but that also kind of maybe presents a few problems because we're not able to study other dimensions. We don't really know if the effects we're seeing are going to be applicable to an object that has a lot more volume and a lot more dimensions. But despite this dimensionality problem, the effects we're observing are still very very similar and in some sense can be interpreted as what would happen inside a real black hole as well. For example, in 2010 one such major discovery was in regards to super radiance. The scientists using a sonic black hole were able to discover that by blasting a sound wave into a certain region of the black hole that we normally refer to as the ergosphere, which you see forming around this spinning black hole right here, they were able to receive more energy than they sent into the black hole. Now this is actually a concept that's been discussed in a lot of different science fiction books and just generally a lot of hard science as well, because today we know that if you were to shine light, for example, into the ergosphere of an extremely fast spinning black hole, the light coming out of there might have a lot more energy than came into the black hole, thus allowing us to produce infinite energy by basically using this particular region around the black hole. This particular experiment was able to prove this definitively. And the more experiments have been conducted over the past decade, the more we discovered that a lot of these sonic black holes seem to predict pretty much all of the predictions from astrophysical black holes. This also includes the mysterious Hawking radiation. The radiation we expect a typical black hole to produce simply because Right here at the event horizon, once in a while, one of the virtual particles produced by the quantum fluctuations, which normally happen in vacuum and especially very close to the event horizon, might accidentally fall into the black hole with the other particle becoming a real particle and escaping the black hole. This naturally drains the black hole of mass and makes it smaller and smaller with time. And though Hawking radiation has already been proven by other experiments, including sonic and optical black holes, we still don't really understand if the actual radiation is constant or if it fluctuates with time, kind of like in some sense a flame of a fire or basically a somewhat unpredictable flare star that might have these Hawking radiation events flare up once in a while and then diminish in activity and become a lot uh, less bright. 
So in other words, one of the questions here is, is the Hawking radiation sort of like a constant glow or is it more or less variable? In more scientific term, what the scientists were trying to really establish now is, is this a stationary radiation? In other words, it doesn't change. And also, is it spontaneous arising from nothing? And one of the latest experiments with the paper that you can find in the description below was able to very accurately simulate all of this by using a very specific gas and by using the sound effects or sound waves inside of that gas. For this experiment, the scientists use rubidium. And although this is a metal, the scientists actually turn it into gas, turn it into, well, basically an analog black hole, with the picture right here representing this analog black hole. And the main principle at work here is that, well, rubidium atoms, at least in gas form, actually flow much faster than the speed of sound inside of these atoms. So the sound wave will actually have trouble traveling inside the atoms if they're flowing at really fast speeds. And this is kind of what the scientists did here. They made the rubidium atoms flow really fast and produce sound waves inside of them, thus creating a kind of artificial black hole on the inside, with the sound waves unable to travel faster than a certain region that in some sense represents the event horizon. Whereas just outside of this region, these sound waves can travel normally. And so here the scientists were looking for similar pairs of sound waves coming from this artificial black hole with one of the waves moving out and one of the waves moving in, thus representing the equivalent of the Hawking radiation. Except that instead of virtual particles, here we're talking about sound particles or phonons. But since all of this was happening ridiculously fast, they could only really take a snapshot of this and then just repeat the experiment many, many times. Eventually producing 97,000 different pictures that took them roughly around 124 days to measure and to perform. And using the experimental data, they were able to definitively say that the sonic black holes, and by extension astrophysical black holes, definitely have stationary Hawking radiation, meaning that it basically kind of shines like a regular star. They radiate a certain type of radiation constantly without changing much. But what's really interesting about this experiment is that during their study, they were accidentally able to create the other unusual phenomenon inside of their black hole, known as the inner horizon which is that dark part that you see right here, and that's sort of inside the event horizon. Now, the thing about inner horizon is that, well, in between the event horizon and the inner horizon, because now you're inside the event horizon, the gravitational pull actually decreases a little bit, and thus you can sort of stay inside of there, traveling at the speed of light, and you can actually hypothetically exist in that area without ever falling completely into the black hole. And what's interesting is that they were totally able to recreate this and they had the sound waves exist in between the inner horizon and the event horizon, which is kind of where we're located right now in this particular simulation of the black hole. And because the gravitational pull inside of this area is lower than it is right above the event horizon, you can basically travel here, you can exist here, you can survive here for as long as you don't really fall deeper beyond the inner horizon. Now, the thing is, you cannot escape this, though. You cannot suddenly leap out of the event horizon and escape the black hole. So, in some sense, you're stuck here. We obviously don't really know what happens here, but by using these black hole analogs, we can maybe one day answer the question of what really happens to objects that are stuck between the event and inner horizons. And another unusual discovery here is that apparently in between the event and inner horizon, the physics kind of go back to normal. So if something makes it through the event horizon, it suddenly finds itself in a somewhat regular environment, at least for the time being. If that object continues falling into the black hole past the inner horizon, things change again and probably end up stretching the object to the point where it gets destroyed. But right before that, the physics and the space-time itself is more or less normal as it was right before the event horizon. And that's mostly because the pull of gravity here is a little bit lower than it is closer to the black hole and also lower than it is right above the event horizon. But this is of course for certain types of black holes, usually the ones that we would call supermassive black holes. Smaller black holes or black holes that are not spinning fast enough might not even have these areas. And what's even more interesting is that when this inner horizon was formed inside the black hole, it suddenly started to produce even more Hawking radiation, which is actually something that's theoretically predicted as well. So in some sense, the scientists in this paper were able to create one of the most accurate representations of an astrophysical black hole. 
something that has only been theoretical before this, and something that a lot of scientists will probably try to recreate once again, which also helps us understand what happens inside the black holes, what happens around them, and possibly also help us understand if any of these effects can be used practically as well. And for now, this experiment does seem to be one of the more interesting and one of the more profound black hole analog experiments. A lot of these results still obviously have to be confirmed and a lot more experiments have to be conducted, but it does seem like the Hawking radiation is indeed stationary. It basically produces a kind of a light that you'd expect from a typical star, and it does look like the more radiation a black hole has, the more likely it's going to have a much more pronounced inner horizon where a certain object can technically survive without really falling into the black hole itself. Here's, by the way, what a schematic of all of this sort of looks like, and you can kind of see both the event horizon and the inner horizon being produced by this very unusual type of a black hole. But I guess until future experiments and until future discoveries, that's kind of all we know about black holes for now, and that's all we've been able to discover. Once the scientists discover something else, I'll make sure to follow this up with another video. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support this channel on Patreon, or by joining the channel membership, or maybe buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Either way, I'll see you tomorrow, stay wonderful, and as always, bye bye.